Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can you hear me? Yes, Prof. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Again, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining this meeting organized by the Center for Professional Development, CPD, IUM today. I am Dr. Raini, the Deputy Director from the Learning Design Unit. And inshallah, I'll be your moderator for uh, today's training. Before we start our session, let's recite, recite Umur Kitab Al-Fatiha. For some of you, I'm, I'm sharing the PDF version, so uh, I will also share my screen. Where's my screen now? Screen number two, okay. Um, it's been a while I use Zoom because <laughs> our university is like, we subscribe to Webex, so uh, we're so used to Webex and sometimes I got a bit lost uh, with the with new new buttons and all that. But anyhow, um, this is the, the slide. I hope you can see it. I have also uh, shared the PDF version. In case the screen is too small for you, uh, you can refer to the slides uh, or the PDF given to you. And as mentioned as well by Dr. Rainey, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, to just you know type in the uh, in the chat box. Okay, um, let's start now. <laughs> so the, the 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 general topic given to me is alternative or and slash authentic assessment. Um, we'll talk about the slash in a bit. Why is it slash? Why is it not and or 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 um, uh, you know uh, the the kind of uh, uh, distinction between these two? All right, so um. Let me start with this one. Oh yeah, this one is already mentioned. The 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 I have to thank um, Juan Hilda. I think she was the one. I don't know whether who who did it, but then somehow she gave me this. So so uh, in a way, I follow the LO uh, given by to me. So I I find it quite useful. The first three will be my focus. I think the last one I'll share bits and pieces about fairness, inclusive inclusivity, and all that. But I think to demonstrate the commitment. It really, you know, goes back to you uh, as an educator. So you, you have to apply it in your teaching and learning. So, but I would share about fairness and all this within these three uh, uh, scopes or three, three parts. So let's go to part one. Um, I'm going to get the ball rolling, but um, just to warm up everyone um, before we go to the topic, I, I, because it's early Friday morning. Let's start with a bit of uh, like a brain teaser. So I just want to warm up everyone. Um, you will see a series of images, all right? And each image represents an expression or a phrase, right? I, I'm sure some of you have played this, but if you have played it, just, just, just participate and give your answer, no worries. Get as many correct guesses as possible. So I, I'm not going to use any platform today. In fact, uh, I have decided to just use the chat box and also maybe you can just unmute um, because you're following too many screens and sometimes when you when you open up too many uh, too many tools, you get lost because you're going to close Zoom and all that. So we just make use of whatever we have on, on Zoom now. Um, you can type your answer in the chat. I think this one you can just type. You don't have to unmute. And But I will give about maybe 30 seconds per you know, per, per image. And then you just type your answer. And then let's see the variety of answers, all right? Okay, let's go to the first picture. Or oh, the first image. This should be easy. Just type all your answer immediately. If you're influenced by other people's answer, <laughs> uh, uh, it's okay. But it's best if you can think of your own answer. Just type in the chat. Okay, good, good. I have variety now. I have clock. I have ones in the lifetime. Each image represents a phrase or an expression, right? So it can be a longer, some say quarter. I like that. You have a variety. It's just by a simple image like this. You, you, get, you get a different answer. So 30 seconds is, some say time is go. It's upon the time. Three o'clock. <laughs> I like that. All right. Okay. I think it took quite a number of you. I mean, we have a lot more. Uh, uh, joining, but if you can't type, it's okay. You just alarm clock and all that. I like. Okay, thirty seconds is up. But what's this? Because the rule says, okay, this is this is this is something that we can apply in a bit. Not the rule. The instruction says you will see a series of images. Each image represents. Uh, so there's an essay. Sorry, an expression or a phrase. Yeah, uh, an expression or a phrase. So this one, the correct answer is 
once upon a time, right? Why? Because the once is upon <laughs> a time. But of course, you can argue that uh, the time is represented by a clock, right? So you can say once upon a clock if you want to, but the correct answer is once upon a time. Okay, let's try the second one. I mean, I think now by, by the time you reach the second one, you get a hang of this. It should be easy for you. The second one. Okay, give your answer now. 30 seconds. What's this? I have top secret. <laughs> Quite a lot here. Oh, everyone's giving top secret. This is too easy. <laughs> a top secret. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Good to see everyone typing. Confidentiality. I like that. <laughs> like. <laughs> okay. Top secret. Why is it top secret? This because secret is um the one being circled is number one, right? The first one. Top secret. Um, of course, you can have you can have some like secret recipe and all that but but the 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 correct answer for this one is top secret but would you accept other variety maybe we'll argue about this in a bit because this relates to what we are talking about today next what about number three i have a total of seven i think this one should be easy as well this one should be easy puzzle number three 30 seconds from now travel line <laughs> i like that this by me very out of the box kind of thinking. Loss in translation to the city. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> travel over the sea. Travel along the sea. All right. Along the sea. Okay, any more variety? I can see some similar. Travel over the sea. Travel over the seas. Okay. Travel card. Travelers. Okay, nice, nice. So it's travel. Travel is, uh, you know, over. How many seas? We have many seas here. So the correct answer is travel over seas. Yeah, the sea should be with the S because of the number of seas. So travel over seas. All right. I have a right. Uh, we have quite a number of interesting answers there. We can argue on that because, uh, yeah, it's going to relate to whatever we're going to talking, uh, whatever we're going to talk about later. This one should be easy as well. This one should be easy. 30 seconds from now. 30 seconds from now. <laughs> this one should be easy because the word fooling is giving you the clue. <clears throat> fooling circle, <laughs> fooling around. Yeah, yeah. I think this one is this one is this one is clear. It's fooling around because of the the arrow. But even without the arrow, I think you can still kind of see that it's round without the arrow, right? Um, but <laughs> you can get uh, other answers like uh, fooling in circle. Why not? Right? It, it makes sense. Fooling is maybe. <laughs> but if it's an expression, then fooling around is more accurate. All right? Okay, let's try number five now. Number five. Oh. This, one, this one should be easy too. No, India, Greco Roman means. Somebody, they is, on. somebody is sharing answer or let me. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, this one, 30 seconds. <laughs> I like that. I like that I try to stand between two. <laughs> I have never thought of that, but it's fine. Stand by on two, try. It. Okay. Yeah, this one should be easy. All right, this one should be easy. Yeah, okay. Because the two is under stand. <laughs> so it's try to understand right but some can can kind of interpret it try stand over two or whatever but the make the, the one that makes sense would be try to understand if you say stand by maybe if uh yeah because try is like next to it but the the two is <laughs> is there right so you're, you're gonna miss out the two there okay anyhow <laughs> Try live by stand up too. I like that. If if you're teaching mathematics or calculus, maybe this one will be more trickier. You can come up with some calculus kind of interpretation. Uh, try stand divided by two. <laughs> all right, or portion of two, right? all that. But yeah, let's try number six. Last last two now. Last two now. Ah, this one should be easy as well. Mm. <laughs> Rescue me. <laughs> Yeah, this one should be clear cut. Excuse, excuse me, because there are many cues here. X, 
excuse me, right? So it's excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> yeah, but it's like <laughs> yeah, but but uh, but ex excuse me. This one because it's playing with the sound, right? It's uh, it's a phrase, right? Last one. I think a lot of you have got this right, but every time I I, I tried this, uh, somehow a lot of people have never heard of the phrase. Uh, and they will give me other answers, but I think all of you should be able to get this right. Um, seven. A lot of this one should be straightforward to you, I guess. Hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Stone Age. Yeah, I got that a lot. That's the one that I get a lot. Stone Age, because it's edge, right? Yeah, you can you can see quite a number of given stone corner, cornerstone, up cornerstone. <laughs> so what's the best one? This one, um, yeah, because it's the problem is it's at the corner. So you know it's cornerstone, right? But then if you play around with the word like edge, then it could be stone edge. I would kind of accept that because it's at the edge, right? At the edge of the uh, the the square. So if you say Stone Age, I kind of would accept that, but um, Stone Age maybe not the right name. But uh, yeah, but I like the one Stone at the corner. That is like um, uh, that is so uh violent in a bit because you are stone at the corner. But but yeah, you get that kind of answer uh when you are giving using pictures and uh, you know that kind of um, uh, impression. But why am I showing it? And I I intentionally end with the word cornerstone. Why do you think I end with this phrase cornerstone? <laughs> because I think mean, whether we like it or not, assessment is always the cornerstone of the whole process of teaching and learning. What's the point of teaching? What's the point of learning? If there's no assessment, right? We still want to know our progress. Uh, whether it's formal or informal, you want to know how good you are in, in, you know, in, in doing something and all that. And how do you know it? It's through assessment. And Assessment can be done in many ways. It doesn't have to be formal. Uh, even when we are learning something, if, if you're following certain tutorial on YouTube and all that, when you do it and then you get the same outcome, you know, that you see on the YouTube video and yours, that gives you an impression that you have done it well. But how? Because you're assessing yourself, right? You're doing a bit of self-assessment. So I, I end with this kind of stuff. I don't know how many, I think quite a number of you got all correct. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, you can claim the prizes from CBD. <laughs> Just kidding. But, uh, but uh, I think the thing is like this. There are many reasons why I, I start with this one. Because not only in terms of the cornerstone, but if you look at the, 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 the way the whole thing is structured, the way the instruction is given and all that, and the way the, um, we, you can call it as construct or the material that you use, it's kind of open for interpretation, right? And it's quite subjective. A lot of people can don't, don't, might not see this as a time. It could be a direct thing as a clock, right? And when you open up that kind of subjectivity, uh, when we are assessing this kind of skills or knowledge, are we going to accept the variety or the variation in the answers? Or we want to accept only one answer or a single definite answer? That's something that we need to really uh, decide when we want to do assessment. And I think in this, in this case, because it's an open thing, and I just say expression and a phrase, technically speaking, if you give me something logical and you know makes sense, I should accept your answers. Like, even though it's not part of what I have listed, but I should accept if it makes sense, right? Um, or if you can justify why that can be the answer. All right. So I'm this is a like a like a real mukadimah or whatever that we want to talk about today, because um Later on, you will see, you will start to be confused whether you, what you're doing, it's really alternative or it's still very traditional. Because over the years, I've seen we, re, we kind of brand things easily by calling it authentic or alternative assessment. But um, in essence, we're still doing traditional uh, assessment. right? So that's something that we, we want to have in mind while, while, while doing this kind of discussion. Let's start with the first one, traditional assessment. Thank you so much for participating all right, to all of you just now. A quick one. I'm sure some may not be able to participate, but something for you to, to, to follow when you, re when you see the recording later. Okay, let's start with this one. 
traditional assessment. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this, and you, you, all of you have been trained, uh, whether you know in in IIUM or in your previous uh, uh, universities when you were you know studying and all that. There's always this uh, notion that it's traditional, all right? And my point here is the reason, I know I don't have to read this because it's, you know what it is. This is by Anderson. In fact, Anderson is recognized as one of the first few who kind of question the, uh, the, uh, the traditional assessment. Rebecca uh, Anderson, you can, you can search this. But it's already quite a long, long time ago. We have been talking about this for so many years now and we're still talking about it. Right, we're still talking about it, and um, it's quite, it's quite, how to put it, um, it's quite interesting to see the evolution of the argument as well. Right, after thirty or forty years, we're still arguing about the same thing, whether it's traditional or whether it's alternative or whether it's authentic. But my question here is this: actually, this one, are they here to stay? Right, can we say that traditional assessments no longer have a place, or um, they should be there for some reason or uh, maybe in a different form, right? We call it traditional, but could be in a uh, different form. Uh, Dr. Sami said, accounting is always traditional until today, right? Even though the accounting world outside is you know, evolving, it's still pretty much uh, traditional. I think many fields too, in, in medical and in engineering, in some cases, they're still pretty much depending on the traditional way of measuring for some Maybe for some valid reason that we, we, we can, you know, we can really share. Okay, now to really test you, to really, really test you, you can look at the slides if you want to download from PDF. And, but I have six, yeah, six type of uh, assignment or tasks. Tell me which one are traditional. I'm going to give you some time, this one, maybe like five minutes for you to go through. This is to be done individually first. You can think about it and then think about the reasons well. Think about it and then we will go through one by one. All right, spend a bit of time, go, go through this and then you can, you, can, um, you, know, you can share your answers in a bit. But go through carefully and then also justify why you think. Why do you think that one is traditional? Well, that one seems alternative, but actually not. All right, so I'm going to give you like a... Uh, do you need a platform? To, maybe I'll, I'll set a platform for this. But while, while, you are, while you are thinking about this for five to five minutes, not long, I'm going to set up a platform for you to type out your answers, yeah? That will be easier for you because I'm not sure whether you can open another screen, but let's see. Okay. You think about it first, right? And then I'm going to set up a quick one here. And for friend. Look carefully, yeah, and then you need to really tell me why you think, you know, uh, why do you think that that which one is in a traditional, which one is not, you know? So maybe to make it easier for you, let me, where's the, my chat? My chat's gone. Okay, here. I know a lot of you are typing. A lot of you are typing, but uh, you might want to also type it in the Padlet maybe because I think a lot of you are typing and then kind of lost. Yeah. But if you don't want to use Padlet, you can do it in chat. I think that chat it will be easier to you because Padlet will mean, will mean that you have to open another tab. But I'm, I'm going through now. Right? I'm going through now.
Hmm, I like, I like, I like the variation now. Okay, just just label it like this, yeah. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. Easier for you. So we 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 count by this. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. I forgot to put the number. Sorry, <laughs> because um, you know. I thought this is going to be a bit more open, but uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you two more minutes, some of you. Remember, in English, your existence put those two lines on that one guard, and it thanks you. Two more minutes to think about this. And then I'm going to ask you, maybe for some of you who are willing to share, you can unmute and share. Why do you think each of it? But I have, I have, um, I have, I think a lot of you are quite, quite clear that number one is one, but like we're going to go to one by one. The rest of you can try. The thing is that these are three more like activities to me. Well, it can be assessment, right? You can assess presentation um, in class depending on, um, depending on um, your, your area, right? So presentation, is, I think it's quite popular as well as a form of assessment. Okay, one, three, is additional, I can see. All right, okay. Again, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, let's go through now. I think you, you get the hang of it. Uh, number one, this is quite obvious. All right, let me, let me, Use my pen first. Okay. Number one, I think the giveaway is this one, right? Doesn't matter how many MCQ question or whatever, whatever uh, format, the giveaway is a time test. So it's traditional, right? Uh, the Thai unit said all, <laughs> all are traditional. <laughs> all right. Okay, we're going to go to one by one. Okay. Number one, everyone agrees this is. Um, Traditional, anyone disagree this is traditional? Just in case, you know, just to be sure. Clear, yeah? No one, no one disagree with this one. So this one is obviously T, traditional. Okay, let's go to the second one. A group of students is tasked with creating a business plan for a startup. They work together over several weeks and present the final plan to a panel of judges, um, including teachers uh, and also ex external experts, right? So what do you think? Is this traditional or not traditional? I think based on your feedback in on chat, let me see whether Padlet has any answer. Yeah, I have some answer on Padlet as well. Okay. No one actually selected, no one actually selected to, why? Ah, it comes the big question. Doctor, Doctor, where is this now? Can't wait. It's kind of good. I lost. Oh, I don't know, uni. Yeah, because you say all right. So yeah, you are the only one who who say <laughs> all are, uh, 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 you know, traditional. So can you tell me why do you think the second one is also traditional? Hi. Good morning. Morning. I think this is mm. a traditional mm. type of assessment. Because um, I have I have experience um, participating in in the assessment of students who are tasked with creating this this similar plan for a startup, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the judges are given specific rubrics and they will give scores, and mm -hmm. the lecturer of this course will grade the student mm -hmm. based on the suggest of the experts yeah. I, I, I don't know I think it's yeah. kind of traditional so, so they still get marks and graded yeah so, so you're in a way you are saying that if it's graded then it is traditional is it, uh, uh, and we have specific um, yeah. Yeah. a time time period of time yeah 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 okay. Okay. okay got it got it thanks anyone okay. else Anyone else who think that this is traditional? 
second the second one nobody i think let me see padlet or well. some are responding on padlet yeah i don't see but one is clear okay tayini has a point when it comes to the later part of it right this is something that i think uh, we need to kind of be clear like i said front part seems very alternative very authentic because you're going to do a business plan for startup right the second part of it where you are talking about the grading part if you allow the grading process to be done in such a way where the external experts are giving the honest view and then the feedback according to the rubrics which are quite similar to the real world not the typical rubrics that you have like you're going to look at the language grammar and all that which has nothing to do with the the whole nature of the task then that task can be a bit traditional because you're not really measuring the authentic part of the process right but assuming now because i'm just giving you a short snippet assuming now once they have presented to the expert panel and all that they are feeling it like a real pitching to the real panel in the industry and all that and then they're going to get the feedback where the lecturers as the person who grade them will award them according to the actual uh, you know assessment given by the expert rather than you know a different type of rubric which has nothing to do with the whole concept of doing a business plan for a startup all right so this is counted as non traditional right or alternative depending on the second part of it uh, so i think you you're going to see some trend now so this one i would call it as non traditional for now right because of the the nature of the whole task is not a, a, a typical test because we always consider the front part only we forgot about the later part right okay let's what about the third one uh, quite a number of contradicting answer here some say yes some say no but it will, it will be good to hear from you each student is required to prepare a 10 minute presentation on the topic assigned by the teacher they present to the class and are assessed on their knowledge of the topic and clarity of delivery what do you think some say yes some say no i can see some say no let's go for no first <laughs> anyone want to share why do you think this is not considered as traditional i mean basically it's authentic any would anyone would like to share you can type if you don't want to unmute it's fine even though unmute is easier uh yeah no one no one actually pick three in the in the list but some yes but i'm going to go for those who did not pick three first like you think three it's it's really it's really you know um it's really more uh how to put it non traditional dalam said may involve creativity yeah yeah but this part what do you think <laughs> I'm just trying to like be a bit more, you know, just picking your brain early in the morning. Anyone else want to share? Maybe those who think this is traditional. Yeah, this is another way of looking at it. Those of those of you who think this is traditional, maybe you know. Um, yeah, Dada Izat, you want to say something? <laughs> yeah. Why is it non-traditional? Why? 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 Uh, hi. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think this is traditional because one of it, uh, this one is being done inside the class. Mm. So I believe that uh, usually traditional assessment uh, more like a summative assessment. Yeah. Like that. So this one more like a formative assessment during the class, some sort yeah. of activity, some sort of like knowledge check during the class. Yeah. An activity to make sure that the student do the task. If yeah. we ask them to do after the class, they don't do it. So. Mm. Yeah, this is one way. I think this is not really a traditional assessment, but depends depends on the uh, the way we grade the, the assessment yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you on that. Uh, Nazrin said anything assigned by teacher is traditional. Can you enlighten us on that, Mr. Uh, Dr. Nazrin? Anything assigned by the teacher is is traditional. <laughs> Where, where where's the nazrin there let me i can't see on the screen uh, are you able to tell us a bit on that um why do you think anything that is assigned by anything that is assigned by teacher is considered as traditional i'm sure you some of you are like getting a bit confused now you know like all this while you learn um traditional assessment means is a sit down test and it has to be summative 
Um, but if you read deeper, tradition can be formative. Right? When you do midterm exam, that's kind of formative. It's not really summative, but it's, con it's considered as traditional because uh, 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 traditional in a way like the test format, even though it's done format formatively. Right? Same thing like quizzes. When you do quizzes, MCQ, progressively, it's formative, but it's traditional. Right? I mean, so, so formative or summative is more on how you use the information when it comes to the, you know, the, the data or the grades that you get more to that um, but when it comes to the way you you design it i think that matters more when it comes to traditional or non-traditional uh, so that's another traditional or teacher is to assess non-traditional would probably be the student to choose their own assessment wow that's that's a bit radical yeah it's quite true the extreme end of uh, non-traditional assessment is always student-led um, in this case i think i would i would label number three as partial right i think contingent on the um on the way it's done. Because the tricky part is this, a topic assigned by teacher. This sounds like standardization. Everyone is going to more or less because you're giving the same topic and on the maybe, you know, everyone could be preparing more or less the same script and everyone could be talking about the same thing. You don't get a variety. You don't really get the, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of freedom that we want to give them in non-traditional assessment. Also, why do you think a topic is assigned? It's easier to grade, right? It's easier to grade as in everyone is talking about the same thing and then you can compare Tom, Dick and Harry. Okay, Tom is better, blah, 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 because everyone is talking about the same thing. Then you can measure the, uh, you can measure the, uh, uh, or you can grade according to what you want to grade. And as mentioned by Dr. Isaac just now, it really depends as well on what we measure. Now, it can be more authentic if they are really presenting something that uh, they have done earlier, for example, like a presentation of a project that they have done, and then they're going to share uh, what they have done, rather than suddenly pick out a topic out of the blue and then ask them to talk, because that's not natural. That's not real life kind of situation, right? Okay, I mean, we're going we're gonna to make this TNT. <laughs> this is like... Uh, you know, TNT. Same thing with this one as well, but this is non-traditional essentially. Uh, some feedback here. I think in traditional students finish everything in the class or exam room in non-traditional, they are challenged to explore resources to accomplish this time. Maybe that's part of it. Okay, interesting take on that. Uh, uh, Dr. Samula said, traditional method keep active uh, both students and teacher. Active maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to take a look at this. the fourth one now. We're going to go very quickly now. Students are tasked to write or are asked, sorry, are asked to write a detailed essay on a specific predefined topic. They are given two weeks to research and submit the essay, which will then be graded. The flexibility is here, right? They're going to give, they are given two weeks to do research and submit. This sounds like a take-home test, right? And when it's, even though it's take-home test, the, 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 the challenge is it, it is supposed to be non-traditional. It is supposed to be non-traditional, but this part kills the whole thing, right? This part kills the whole thing. Again, when it comes to uh, non-traditional assessment, the flexibility should be there, but not too open in a way. You can give a scope on areas, but once you have a predefined topic, everyone has to rush and do on the same thing, on the same topic. There's just some form of standardization there and um, everyone has to complete an essay, right? Which may not be authentic according to the task that you want, unless you're teaching language. Again, if you're teaching like, for example, language, and then you're teaching them academic uh, essays, they have to write academic essays and all that, it's fine. Even then, it's not really, it's not really authentic, right? Because that's not something we do in real life. How many time like i ask my students all the time how many times those who are working now how many times in your life somebody actually asks you to write an academic text out of the blue in workplace based on a given topic right it's very rare but if you change it to a different context like you're going to write a proposal for some some you know for some uh, funding for your for your charitable charitable research and all that, I mean, charitable project, and that maybe it makes more sense to apply that kind of academic convention in writing rather than asking them to write like a typical essay that they do in the test, right? So I think that's something that we need to change when it comes to how we view uh, traditional and non-traditional assessments. So this one, like all of you agreed, I think most of you agreed, this is pretty much traditional, 
right? Pretty much, it's, it's just like a test. You just give them more time, all right? You give them more time. You give them more chance of getting the resources. But technically, they still have to do on the same um, academic essays that they submit, which may not be naturally represented in the real world, right? Uh, fifth, student compile a thought for this is a this is our favorite when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to non-traditional or, or alternative assessment. We love this. So then compile a portfolio of work completed over the semester, including essays, project report, reflective entry. They submit this portfolio for assessment at the end of the term. So what do you think? I think a lot of you, a lot of you, wait, let me check uh, the chat just now. Yeah, a lot of you kind of do not, do not list, but Dr. Siti Aisha says uh, it, it is. Dr. Izati as well. Maybe any one of you, Dr. Izati or Aisha, Dr. Siti Aisha, who mentioned about this as a traditional. I'm going to share a bit. I think you, you, you two are the only one who, who responded. Uh, yeah. Is that okay. it? Yeah, why? Uh, why traditional? Because it is basically a compilation of works. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I think this uh, is our obsession. It sounds like portfolio. Yeah. But basically, it is the compilation of works. Like Sometimes yeah. we do discuss it in class. Like for example, reflective yep. essays. After they're done for after a project and they do one or yeah. two pages of reflective essay, they will present it at, yeah. you know, in class. So there's project reports. It is very traditional, but it's just they will they compile it at the end of the day. Yep, that's that's really nicely put, right? I think this is the obsession. We, we kind of change traditional assessment to sound like authentic or alternative by just changing the mode. But essentially, this one, like essays, project reports, reflective notes, that's not something that we put up as a portfolio and show it to the world kind of thing, right? I mean, it sounds more like a, a, something that we put in a, in a folder and then just pass it to for the lecture. You know what I mean? If you want it to be digital portfolio, there must be a reason why it has to be a digital portfolio. There must be a reason why it has to be in a portfolio format. For example, if you want them to showcase the ability to design something like, you know, like those in arts, they love portfolio because that's how they showcase the artwork compared to the way they submit to you and you keep it, you know, in your folder. If you put it up online, like using all this digital platform, they get the visibility and then they get the chance to showcase uh, the design work that they have done, right? So that's the reason why the portfolio is done in such a way. But this one, who on earth would, actually read your essay project report and reflective note you know in a portfolio format i mean i get it i get it the nature of it it sounds very alternative because we kind of go away from the traditional submission format but the essence of it the content of it is still pretty much traditional all right so i would call this tnt as well <laughs> in a way because it really depends on how how you structure the essay and everything. But if you are talking about copywriting, I'm teaching copywriting, for example, you want students to get exposure to how they gain clients, right? Because copywriting means you really need to go for, look for clients, like clients who will hire you for copywriting. Then when you ask them to put up portfolio, they don't just put whatever they do for class, activities and all that. They, they present it in such a way like they're selling themselves, like a branding of themselves. Look, I'm good in copywriting. This is some of the works they have done. It should be in that kind of format rather than just compile all the copywriting thing that they have done in class. You get what I mean? So the, the difference is more or less in terms of this. But when you change this, it also means you have to change your rubrics, your marking scheme, because you are not looking at just a compilation of work. You're looking at how all these works are being put in the portfolio format that takes a different form in an authentic way, in a way, that it works better, right? So um, we're going to go deeper as we go, but I, I, in, I intended to start with this one because I want you to have that kind of uh, clarity when it comes to authentic and non-authentic or even traditional or alternative assessment. Last one, I think a lot of you agree this one is traditional. Some say no, but quite a number of you say yes. What about this one? I think the, <laughs> it says students work on a project the, 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 this is this is a this is like a like a trap. It says work on a project, but then suddenly individually. 
<laughs> work in a project tapi suddenly you know uh, individually so this this is this kills the whole the whole thing because um, traditional assessment tend to be very individual individualized we don't allow not to say we don't allow collaboration we don't prioritize uh, collaboration because we want to measure individual performance so this one seems like a like a project but it's individual right and then of course the letter part you will see given scope and required to submit a written report and then the worst part is this they have to focus only on content organization and language there's no authentic uh, elements in the whole project right like again it's just like a normal test where you write and then you are going to be graded according to whatever you want to grade okay so let's say this is a language course imagine this is a language course this is prob probably professional writing for example or technical writing uh, by right they should be sitting for a test you know in a two-hour test but instead of doing two hours you say oh i want to do final assessment i don't want to do tests because i just change it to this mode because it's individual final like a final exam style because it's still individual but it's still not authentic or still not alternative because it's still a test it's very test-like right due to the Due to the way it is is done or it's designed, all right? Yeah, the time you say similar like individual final year research project, so it's technically still pretty much traditional way of uh, 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 assessing. So you can see here, there's a many gray area now, and then I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope I get you to think that traditional or non-traditional is beyond just the type, right? So which brings me to the next one on on this. I give you that kind of scenario and the kind of sample because those are real things that I get as well because I compile uh, all this given my my fellow colleagues in uh, in Unimas so we take a look at everyone's style of doing assessment but a lot of time uh, we 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 are still doing traditional but we camouflage it with some alternative terms so called alternative types so you have to be more careful when we want to really go for an alternative assessment or authentic assessment, we have to really look at all the parts of it, right? So now we're going to go one by one. <laughs> okay, so we have an alternative assessment and then I, I start with the question, how alternative is alternative? Because it's for almost four decades now, like I said, uh, all these things for more than four decades. We're talking about all this classroom-based assessment, alternative assessment, authentic assessment, and still people are still arguing whether you know what we are doing is really authentic or really uh, alternative so this is the term first and then you can see authentic is part of it all right and it says here informal this is the part that i think we will question a lot because we use uh, alternative assessment as a form of a formal measurement so we can't really go for um we can't run away that's my point we can't run away from this part we are still doing a bit of formal assessment, right? Formal, because we have it in a formal setting, but it's a bit informal because they are not sitting it in the test format or test uh, hall or exam hall and all that. They still have to go out and do, you know, do different types of activities and all that to supplement whatever they have learned in class. But if you would like to argue on this definition or this, this um, how to put it, this uh, uh, um, concept, bring forward by Hoffman at all, you probably can argue on this because we are pretty much formalizing this because alternative assessment initially was not meant to be graded. It's supposed to be like uh, Dr. Isaac mentioned, has to be formative and then non-graded in a way. We just want to check on the progress and all that. But along the way, you can see, we try to formalize this due to many reasons. We want it to be more um, systematic, right? So that you don't, have uh, too many areas of subjectivity. The problem with subjectivity is the issue of quality, because this is where you know MQA will argue that we we need, we still need to look at the quality part. By right, if you say alternative assessment, I should do whatever I like, right? I mean, if you hold true the actual concept of alternative assessment, then you can do whatever you like. But the thing is, once you do everything you like, then the quality word will come out. Q. How do I know that your students are better than mine, Jay? You know, we are teaching the same course. You use, you use a different assessment. I use my own assessment, right? And then we'll be arguing <laughs> for, for, for days, for weeks. How do we know that yours is of good quality and mine are you know, of different quality? Because we are using different type of 
assessment method. So technically speaking, we are formalizing um, alternative assessment in such a way so that it's easier to compare. But the thing is, that's the irony of it. The moment you have element of comparison and performance, then we are get, get going back to traditional. <laughs> it depends the purpose of doing alternative. Okay, so I'm going to leave this open. I intentionally put it. So how alternative is alternative now is due to the requirement of quality, right? Quality assurance and, and quality control kind of thing. But let's, let's put it this way. We try our best to make it more alternative, but when it comes to the reporting, evidences and all that, we also try our best to be slightly more traditional. <laughs> so we have to go both ways in a way. We have to mix. The, the way we design and develop the assessment are really authentic or alternative. But when you do the reporting, we still have to rely on some traditional elements. I think now you're doing it. Why do you have to key in all this you know, by, by LO and all that? Because that's traditional way of measuring. We are quantifying something to allow comparison to be done to allow quality to be checked, right? So that's some, there's some form of formalization there. But if you hold true to the whole concept of traditional, or sorry, uh, alternative assessment, by that, it should be really informal, like as mentioned just now, something we do in class, something we just check on progress, and then you know, we, 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 we do it for, for the purpose of learning, this one, right, for learning, not really how we measure it. But I think now you know, I mean, uh, that uh, all these years, you are still doing this, right? Because students are still, still getting A, B, C, D, still getting four, da, 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 da. and then we are still looking up to, oh, students who, who did badly C and below, we will be saying that, oh, these students are not really meeting the minimum requirement. But how do you set the minimum? It's still pretty much standardized and uh, test-based, right? Okay, never mind. That's something for you, us to think. <laughs> so this is the, the so-called, the um, uh, I think you had the slides already, the, the so-called distinction between uh, a traditional and uh, alternative, but this was done quite long ago by Bailey in 1998. But if you check recent literature, they will give you more or less the same distinction. I think you can see like traditional is pretty much test, 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 and individualized. And then I, I don't agree on this, right? I think traditional assessment, we do give it back. It's just that the feedback uh, probably later because it's largely summative because traditional assessment tend to be summative. We don't really give progressive feedback, but there are some form of feedback. So I don't really agree on this. A time exam, right? But although traditional assessment can be untimed, like when you give them take home tests and all that, uh, the contextualized uh, test task, I think this one is quite key. We take out the context and then we just measure like using MCQ and all that. This is norm reference again, score interpretation. Norm reference means we will adjust the uh, the, the, the baseline according to the performance. If we realize that that batch, the highest is 60, then we will pull down the rest of the norm. I mean, the baseline. This is norm reference. But I think in our case, we don't really do that in university. If they don't meet the requirement, then they don't meet the requirement. If they don't get 80, they don't get 80. But I think in some tests like uh, SPM and all that, they will adjust the, uh, you know, the, the, the baseline, right? And then we have standardized tests. Okay, so these are the, the so-called alternative one, right? But I think what we need to focus on is this, okay? Because it's part of alternative and we will try our best to focus more on this one because I think this one is the one that will give you that hint um, of whether you are doing traditional or non-traditional assessment. This one, <laughs> longitudinal, uh, yeah, it's a bit subjective. I don't think you have time. We have only 14 weeks of lecture or I mean, 40 weeks of semester. We don't really have time to, for this. But if you're talking about postgraduate level and all that, maybe, right? But uh, normally we don't get to have long, longitudinal uh, assessment, okay? Right. Okay, let's go to authentic. I asked the same question just now was how authentic is how authentic. Now is how authentic is authentic, all right? So Wiggins, in 1989 was the first one, uh, recognized as the first one to coin this term authentic assessment um, by defining as it is on page. You can go to this, you can download this later. It's, I put the reference here on the exact page 703. He says this, a true test. Still test, still test, but it's a true test. What do you mean by true test? You, you involve them in solving problem, you know, uh, more on deeper understanding, more on the hot thing, right? And we are still talking about hot until now. And then you are also talking about exemplary tasks, meaning it's task-based in, in essence. 
um, we don't measure them according to just uh, knowledge, like uh, take out MCQ and then we measure chapter by chapter, 20 questions, 30 questions or MCQ and all that. Not really authentic, that one. In fact, it's not authentic at all because that's not something that you do in real life. But if you uh, turn it into a task, they still need to apply the knowledge that they have. They still need to make use of the uh, all the things that they learn in class and all that to perform the task. Then it's more authentic than the traditional way of doing it. All right. <laughs> I like this. I like this. Uh, you know, comment you can see here. I see you did well in school, but what real world skills do you have? Tests. I can take tests. All right. So. I mean, you can argue all this. Some people need the test to, to be functional. Um, so I, I think towards the end of this session or this training, uh, you, you will realize that you can't really go one way. You really need to mix it up, right? You need to mix it up, some traditional and some uh, non-traditional one, okay? So let's, let's take a look at this and then I'll ask you to design something in a bit. And then we will talk, we'll, we'll see some tools as well, some hands-on on tools. Um, these are the common features. If you have this in your assessment, right, uh, you can try and pull it away from traditional. For example, um, you assess more on the learning process. How do you do this? Meaning you don't look at the final product alone. You're going to measure them progressively. So uh, a big project, for example, 30%, you can have like 10, 10, 10. So each 10 is progressively assessed, like week one, week two, week three, for example. So you are looking at the progress rather than one off product or one at the end of a third week. So that is one element. You also encourage uh, self-reflection and self-monitoring actually. But this one, depending on how you want to do it, if it's individual, then maybe it's easier. If it's group, it's quite, quite tricky. Right? If it's group work, it's quite tricky to monitor. But I think a lot of you are being creative now. Even my colleagues are very creative. They require students to document, right? You have They have to submit the... Uh, whatever discussion they have, if they do Google Meet, they have to screenshot, they have to report a bit, like what time did they meet, what, what were their conclusions. And what. I think that's some form of uh, monitoring. And it's good because you don't look at the final product alone. You're going to give them marks for the progress as well. And design based on authentic tasks with real, I think the key is this one, real world. The only problem now is um, um, the real world is, is rapidly changing and at times whatever you have done last last two years or last few years may not be relevant anymore so you really need to keep keep in touch with the current trend and whether it's still relevant so which is why sometimes it's good to get get the industry to be involved and check if you're teaching some courses uh, quite related to the uh, in, to the real world then uh, it's good to talk to them like i give you my example i'm teaching copywriting for example and then now with ai all these bosses uh, who are running all this copywriting or media agency, they are telling me, we don't need your students anymore. We just pay AI. <laughs> they, they subscribe to AI, paying like 40 USD per month. I don't have to pay thousands per month just to get things done because your students are doing the same thing. I mean, that's the argument. So this is where you have to think, okay, now if they are expecting something better, then we have to argue or we have to change our maybe content a bit or assessment a bit to test students on slightly better things. Maybe more creativity in the copywriting part, not something similar to what uh, all this AI can produce, right? So you always have to go a bit higher or else it's not no longer relevant, okay? Like social media management as well. If you're teaching social media management or communication, this social media keep on changing, right? Whatever you thought, like for example, Twitter now is no longer Twitter and then X has so many limitations now and all that. You have to keep updating. If you still hold true to the same one that you did like a couple of years ago, then it may no longer be relevant. So this is the challenge for number two, right? This is the challenge. Somebody, somebody say something? Okay. If you, if, you need, if you need to ask anything, you just, just unmute, yeah? And then just interrupt me, no problem. <laughs> Provide sufficient flexibility. This is the part that we dislike. We dislike due to many reasons. First, um, if we give more, we have more headache in um, marking or grading because the variety will kill you. <laughs> if you have a small class, it's fine. If you are teaching a large class, then the variety can kill you in a way you're going to get a whole bunch of different type of things and then you're going to figure out, oh, how am I going to grade this, right? But if you have a marking scheme, which is quite clear, even though they have the flexibility to decide whatever they want to do, um, they are still, you know, still, still mark on the same thing. 
I want to touch on this. I mean, time space is fine. You give them more time, more space, as in they can work elsewhere, whatever they want. They can go to the field. They can go and interview people, whatever. But one thing that I I not realize in Unimas, for example, is this. You have a very nice idea. You want them to do a business plan for startup, for example, but the format that you require them to submit is still traditional type. You know, Times New Roman double spacing with the cover page. It doesn't look like a proper business plan at all. <laughs> you get what I mean? So if you want them to be ex uh, getting exposure to the real world, you need to check what is the real format that the real world are doing not the typical assignment format that we still want them to follow with the cover page, with the metric number and all that. Those are details that they can submit through online or whatever. But if you want them to feel the actual thing, by right, the format should be the actual thing, should be the authentic thing that they, they will do in real life. Uh, for example, again, like social media management, for example, if you design a task and then they submit to you in the form of essays, like describing how they were going to do IG to, for, to promote and all that in double spacing, times you Roman, you know, staple assignment and uh, submit it to you. That doesn't make sense. As compared to them, right, coming up with a proper plan and then execute it on IG, like a, like a mock-up of all the things that they will do and then show it to you. That's more authentic because that's what they're going to do in the real uh, situation. All right. So something for, for us to also think about because we're still hold true like cannot run away from that format that we want it to be standard. I don't know why actually. I <laughs> I did ask um, MQA officer before. Is it? They said no. There's no such requirement that you have you have to standardize the cover page or whatever. As long as you have the you know the the assessment metrics, the alignment, it clearly reported in a in, in on your end, right? Whatever the students submit, you just have to you just have to uh, align to that. I mean. They can submit in any format that you think is relevant to to the task or to the to the assessment. All right. So I know this is something that we we, we are so used to, right? But uh, something for us to consider, unless there's a certain format that we have to follow. For example, if you're talking about FYP or even thesis, that's already a thesis format, so it's fine. They don't submit it in a typical assessment uh, assignment format. They submit in a thesis format. Same concept. If you want them to do. Uh, a portfolio and all that. It should be in a portfolio style, uh, like a proper uh, portfolio that they will get in the industry or in the real world. Not a portfolio, but then it's just attachment, 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 just like the compilation of work, like what was mentioned just now. All right? So it doesn't fit the intention of having it to be authentic or having it to be alternative. Right? Okay. Now, uh, we can, yeah, maybe we can use this and then we're going to take a 10 minute break so that, you know, you have a breather and all that. But while you are taking your break, go through this, all right? Go through this, same thing that we did earlier, but now take a look at this and uh, examine whether, um, you know, those that you think may not be authentic or cannot be made authentic. Yeah, make it be better. Cannot be made authentic. Means, by nature, it is already non-authentic, right? That's my point. Uh, find out those that you think by nature is already non-authentic, cannot be made authentic at all, right? So later on, we'll, we'll go through. So take 10, right? Take 10. While you are taking the short break, you can think about this. Okay, all right? Think about this. Maybe I'll change this instruction so it's clearer for you. Oops, sorry. I'll change this instruction. Oh, cannot be made authentic. All right, means it's very hard for you to make it authentic because it's already very traditional. Take a look at it and then, um, yeah. Then we argue. <laughs> while you're taking your short break, 10 minutes break. If you have any question now or ever, you can put it up and then I'll entertain while we are taking our short break. Um, good to hear from you when it comes to the things that you're doing. They thought I'll ask you to share as well if you have done any of this and then uh, we'll learn from each other. Gonna
has as mine that you were mentioning. My question is regards to okay, uh if if you don't follow the format, let's say we put one assignment yeah. regarding, regarding to basic subject like principle and practice of management. Okay. Um if you're talking about basic management, uh mm. assessment, what alternative assessment that we can we can do, let's say we just with them want to give a proposal, come with a format of proposal. Mm. And some of these proposal come from uh formatted by which have formed by uh how how we how we see proposal being given in the yeah. industry perspective. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. and they have to follow all the format so called like the thesis method you mentioned just now. Yeah. Proper form, proper yeah. format, alignment. Yeah. So is 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 it is it commendable in your perspective on that matter? Because I have another question with guys. I just want to know about that. First. Sure, sure. Uh -huh. uh, um, no, when I when I say submission format as in not the traditional way of like you know cover page with the with the Unicy logo and everything. So what you said is true. You just kind of check what is the typical style that they do in the industry, and then uh, tell student that the format that they are submitting is just similar to the is similar to the one that the industry is using but of course when it comes to the uh, alignment or whatever you, if you want to decide you can decide because you want to also uh, confirm on the, uh, the the workload right because the number of words and everything so like in my case right normally i don't specify the font size right? i just i just specify the uh, i just specify the word length that's it. Like you, you should not submit more than seven thousand word or eight thousand word, for example, or maybe four five thousand word. But whatever format they want, it's up to them. But it has to be similar to what uh, the industry is using. For example, I, I think like you said just now, you can show uh, management maybe like all these consultancy firm like Price Waters Coopers and all that. See yeah, how they really? present it. Then, then in fact, uh, the student will get excited because they feel like they are now a consulting agency that they are submitting it like a proper proposal rather than treating it like a, treating it like a, 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 a assignment for you, right? What, what, one thing good about authentic or alternative assessment is we want students to feel like the assessment that they are submitting is not just for us. It's like, it's like something that they, oh, they want it to be done like, oh, okay, we're going to make it nicely done because this is what the industry wants, right? Okay. Uh, do I do okay. I answer the question? <laughs> okay. No, because yeah. I, I'm 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 quite uh, I'm quite attracted with the way when you say about consultant consultant being yeah. a consultant. What should you yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's say we give a case study, and that case study is about the scenario of that organization. That's nice. Let's say it's about one hospital in the United States, and we say change the name of the United States and bring it to the country itself. Let's say Malaysia. Yeah. Let's say we put it to the general hospital thing and that perspective. Yeah. and check everything and and put an imagination that that is our general hospital yep. and act yourself as a consultant yep. and uh, in that uh, they feel that that's what I'd say they, uh, I'm not sure how far do they really feel that they are like a consultant mm. but when they act on that they say this is tough for us so we are in the third year we are going to go to the real life so we want to make things exciting and and, and how many times that I have been trying to manage instead of giving a proposal in the form of being a consultant coming with a form of words, I kept formatting like I said, I said yeah. you have to present like a PowerPoint. I just want to see how you present and mm -hmm. how you do your PowerPoint and mm -hmm. make sure your PowerPoint is a professional style. Mm -hmm. By the end of the day, it does not work in that way. I'm not sure mm -hmm. whether I'm that interesting or not to make them to be interested. <laughs> but the question now is that, is it? It all not happen. It happens only one university which I'm at, and I have been monitoring this for quite a while. Yeah, and I found that, and they have to go to the basic basic format. Yeah, uh, they will go back to the basic yeah. format as yeah. says. Is this how you want? Correct, correct. Uh, yeah. I, I I, I agree. I totally agree because that's how they were taught in 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 secondary school too, especially those from form six, when they are doing the the so called kajian and all that. It's very typical. Yeah. The one that we see in 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 yes. in the sub typical submission typical, method. Yes, yes. And then when they come to university, they they have the same mindset. And then when they see some lectures are also doing that, so they assume everyone is going to accept the same format. So in my case, for example, I, I'm teaching uh, first year and second year. Even from the first year itself, I told them, uh, you you can follow whatever other lectures are doing, but in my classes, you need to follow 
my way of thinking. I, I told them. So they, they don't have to compare like, oh, how come, how come Dr. Dr. Hadi guna that kind of format and then you are not going to use that format? I said, because this is their yeah. different course. It's a different course. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Yeah, so they have to do that. I know it's hard and takes a lot of effort to really change the mindset. Even now, I'm struggling as well, to be honest. Like I can show you one of my tasks now uh, while we are having a short break. Uh, I think I put it somewhere here. This is this is a task for one of the course I'm teaching. It's supposed to be a social media digital campaign. Just just to let you know. So this is digital, social media, okay? Yeah, digital media content. So they, you can see here they only need to submit a four page campaign plan, and then I don't want them to 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 use uh, typical Microsoft Word because they have to produce this in an engaging layout using suitable tool. Because I showed them some sample uh, from the industry, like all the social media agency and all the, how they do it. And then I also come up with my own sample. And what I found is by having my sample as a guide, they understand better. And then they, this is like a typical thing, not the typical assignment that I want them to, I want them to submit like this. Like they have a proper, you know, lay uh, SD like, down. An info, like an infographic. Uh. Yes, and then submit the 14 week. And then that's it. That's all they need to do. In fact, I told them this will be better because this is what the industry wants. They don't have time to read through your AI-generated <laughs> explanation and all that. <laughs> they want you to be clear-cut, yeah. you know, and you learn how to how to make it concise, right? So it takes a lot of effort. I do agree on that. But maybe you can try giving them uh, your sample, like, uh, uh, or maybe you have some students who have done it before. You can show them, okay, this is what I'm expecting you to produce because students tend to be students. They... Uh they I, I kept your statement there for a while not to say uh, i'm not disagree yeah. Yeah. once you give the sample they, they will follow right that sample. yeah 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 so 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 another way is once you once you give the sample like what i did so i said if you follow whatever i'm done then you're you're not going to get high mark <laughs> that's yeah, how yeah, i yeah. also your marking scheme by the way your marking scheme did i put it here uh we're going to talk about this in a bit but the marking scheme actually matters what happened is oh, this is not the one let me see what I mean here is um, if you, oh, here, sorry. If you have this kind of things and then you want them to be, for example, in engaging layout, your marking scheme should, should, should assess this. So students are very clever. They are very clever. They see that you, 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 you want all this and then they don't see this. Uh, sorry, they don't see this in your marking scheme. No marks for uh, the layout or whatever. No marks for creative presentation or whatever. They don't then see it. They don't see the rubric. They just give you the uh, Microsoft Word, right? I'm going to download Yes, the yes. They don't see the rubric. Yeah, but yeah. basically, nowadays, I put them to build into a PowerPoint. Uh, and that's one of the attractive segments. But there are times which I, I try to bring Kahoot also in the class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Uh, when it comes to Kahoot, it uh, seems that they really participate here, But they look, uh, that's why I said, um, many ways have been tried. Yep. We have been trying many ways in order to, uh, to get them interesting in that programs but there are times that it feels that um, uh, they, they, get, they want to be so in once in a while they want to be back to the old form old tradition yeah 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 I, I agree I agree in fact now now I mean after after a while doing this I, I have get, I get I get the trend already in fact um, the things that is those who those who are really excited about the subject they will really follow what they, what you want them to follow as in like all this format. But those who just want to get the A, they don't yeah. really with the means. They just want to you to measure the output. So they will argue, they will say, did I follow what you wanted? So if I, you know, if I did, then you should assess me accordingly. I mean, that's how I get sometimes. Yes. Um, yes. Regardless of the means, <laughs> I get that a lot as well. In fact, yeah. like when you, when you mentioned Kahoot, I like when you mentioned Kahoot and all that. Uh, so I was trying a lot of gamification previously. Those who question the gamification part are not the weaker ones, are all the intelligent ones. The uh, intelligent one will tell you, I don't want to play games anymore. Like, can you stop playing all these games because I just uh, don't know what is the test? Like, can you tell me what's going to come out in the test? I think it's sad because that's how our system has trained them to think. Like, um, <laughs> they expect all, all learning to be just really test based, really outcome based, like, yeah. uh, way, like just look at the outcome. But I, I think it takes a lot of time to convince them. But you can't change everyone, obviously. So uh, yeah. maybe, you know, keep, just keep on trying. Lah. Keep on trying. Lah. Okay, I would thank you, thank you. Thanks for that. I keep trying. But you don't, don't stop. I mean, don't stop. Because the moment we stop, um, 
we are we are giving them the chance to go back to the old way of thinking and once they go out to the industry and then they don't get the job they will reflect i should have listened to dr duhadi last time if if we follow what she, he told us we would come up with a better plan now for example like, you know if if that happens <laughs> if that happens one day in the future you did your job meaning they realize the importance of what you want them to do but they didn't do it right so um it's not it's not really like blaming yourself kind of thing like right? it's more on to, uh, you do what is right and then uh, in the long run if you if you notice that the students are regretting for not following your 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 way of thinking or your way of wanting them to do then it means you it works even though it's too late but yeah. it still works right <laughs> like, i mean yeah i mean i mean ho- hopefully maybe as you do a many cycles then um, you can also ask them to share those who love it maybe can also ask them to share uh, why do they think it's useful for them and all that and then um, give them that chance to to also voice out their opinion i i love to listen even those who are, who are against my gamification approach or even my assessment i love to listen to them and then i will find out oh okay that's why they don't like the you know they don't like the uh, the the method or they don't like the approach because everyone learns in a different way anyway right uh, um, so we have to you know we have to give them- All right, the, the, okay. okay. Yeah. But just keep going. I like yeah, your I like your idea of having this kind of industry. But in fact, students should know that. I mean, we are preparing them for the real world anyway. And if they keep on, you know, enjoying the moment of submitting essays in submit, you know, the typical s- submission format, they are not doing justice for themselves. Actually, they have to think beyond that. Like, uh, they are not submitting it for the lecture. They are submitting it for the way they have to build. Somebody want to say something, Said? Is it? Before we continue, are there lagi? Okay, I think, I think, I think this, this, this one done. Mister Chua, thank you very much for the response. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Are there? Can we continue? <laughs> okay. Interesting discussion. I mean, brought by the. In fact, uh, it's in my slides. If you go through later on, you'll see uh, my point there, where um, we can't be too obsessed with alternative altogether. There will be areas where. Traditional has a role, right? Traditional assessment still has a role, and um, we have to balance, lah, in a way, right? Um, now going back to this one, any <laughs> any feedback on this? Um, those that you think may not be authentic or cannot be made authentic at all, any anything here that cannot be made authentic, <laughs> or all, you know, seems to be workable. Anyone want to say something? <laughs> Or maybe chat. Type in the chat. Do you agree that all are capable of being made authentic? Right. What about this one? Let me let me use my pen for a while. This one. Is that authentic or uh, or can be made authentic? <laughs> Just curious. Because this is the list that are taken from uh, from from the uh, I think Bailey is uh, or uh, not Bailey this one, um, Com and Hubley, all right? Com and Hubley in 2011. They they kind of list out some sample. In fact, this this list was used in many 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 uh, blueprint and even uh, guidelines for authentic assessment. You can see similar similar example. But my question is, open book test or exam is that counted? As authentic, but then he said yes. All depend on the way we create the instruction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the safe answer. <laughs> all right, because it it really. But what about the the this one, the one that I am I highlighting now, the the word or the phrase specifically mentioned tests and exam. This one, right? How is this? You know. How is this fitting uh, into that narrative or that idea or notion of uh, authentic assessment? Is test authentic? Any idea? I did that. Those of different industry can argue on this. I'm sure I'm going to get um, different views on this. Those from humanities and social sciences uh, may feel like open book test is pretty much not really authentic, but in some field, open book test can be relevant. Uh, like. Um, Like the professional fields, right? Like uh, somebody mentioned just now, uh, can't remember. Accounting, 
because when they sit for ACCA and all that, it's still pretty much testing, right? So in order for them to, to be trained for that kind of environment, that test is technically still authentic <laughs> because that's how it works in the industry, right? But uh, by nature, if you, if you look at open book tests, the only thing that makes it even a little bit more authentic is the front part, right? I'm sure a lot of you have done this, where instead of asking students to sit for the test for two hours, uh, if you give them open book tests, they can have whole day maybe, maybe two days, and, you know, but, but longer than the typical exam time. Um, the open book part, you are giving them flexibility. You're giving them the alternative option, but authentically, authenticity-wise, it's not really authentic, depending on how you, how you design again. But most of the time, it, it's very hard to be authentic because you're taking it out and then and put it as a test. But if you combine with other things like your open book test, it's not really the test like MCQ or whatever. You are using case studies, right? You are using you are using some you know some other forms of authentic assessment. Then it's it's okay, right? Um, okay, I get some feedback now. Yeah, my exam during my PhD exam, there is an open book exam, but none of the question is from the book. <laughs> Both of the questions are from the problem in the industry. We have to think, yeah. So even though the name is open book test, it's not really open book, like a top typical test. It, it, it technically means you're assessed based on real cases. So I think it's more on the rebranding of the name. So I, I, I personally do not like the word open book test. You know, what, when you mean, what, what you mean by open book test is like you are giving them resources, right? The, the essence is you're giving them chance, you're giving them resources to, 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 to answer the question. But, you know, it's still a test if it's limited to two hours, three hours, right? So um, yeah, it's pretty hard, pretty hard to to really confine that to to authentic assessment. Uh, the gentleman said should allow them to even answer using ChatGPT. Hence, we should opt for workplace based assessment ability to to search for correct answer also can be tested. Yeah, true, true. So if you redesign your test in a way where you're going to allow them to use all these uh, generators and all that, and then uh, assess their ability on getting the answer instead of the answer alone, then you are doing a, a bit more than just the traditional assessment. So again, it depends on the rubrics or the marking scheme. If your marking scheme just measure the content, just measure the output, then it defeats the purpose. But if you're also looking at the skills or like the types of resources that they use or the number of resources that they use and all that, then that, that gives a bit more um, uh, Ability, I mean, not ability, add on the features of authentic assessment, like not too traditional. Okay. All right. Let's, let's move on a bit. Um, when to use, I think this one, you, you know, <laughs> but most of the time we tend to rely on authentic assessment if we focus a lot more on critical thinking or even practical skills. Those practical skills, definitely you will not be able to use the, uh, the traditional way so much because you really want them to, to use it in the real world or real context. Of course, you, you're, going, you're going to use real world scenarios. And then uh, when you want to assess the overall incentive subject, meaning as a whole, right? Not the uh, factual recall, right? More on the holistic measurement of the capability, not bits and pieces on the facts, record, uh, you know, memorization and all that. And also you're going to give them more control. If you want to give them more control, then you should consider authentic assessment, right? So you don't predefine a lot of things. Uh, I find it interesting sometimes when I when I look at some assessment, like uh, in 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 engineering. I, I remember this uh, project project management course. Was it IDP or what? Um, so students were required to go on a project, but then they don't they are not allowed to choose other topics but one. So the lecture has fixed one topic. And, uh, uh, but the, the instruction says, uh, be something like be creative in, uh, be creative in generating the ideas and all that, but the topic is fixed. And then even the format are fixed in a way like they cannot go beyond certain scope. They cannot go beyond uh, a certain uh, 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 criteria, right? Initially, I thought those criteria are like the standard in a way like, you know, engineers would have that kind of standard. But then when I asked, I said, no, there's no such standard. It's just that I want it to be easier for me to mark. So when you get that kind of feedback from the lecture that I want it to be easier to mark, then you know that it's not really authentic because you are modifying 
you're modifying an authentic task to fit your uh your 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 grading process right sometimes it happens i mean i don't blame the lectures i just want to know why right then once you get the point like you know they're going to limit it because i want it to be easier to mark then you know that that is slightly less authentic now and then when you check the students work you will see kind of like everyone give you more or less the same answer because of that 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 the limitation or the the constraint is too limiting but then you want them to be creative this is what i meant by sometimes we are contradicting ourselves we want them to be creative we want them to be innovative in coming up with new ideas or new new product or new invention and all that but then we limit them right much like, um, we want them to think out of the box but we keep putting the box on top of their head right something like that so so uh yeah something for us to think if you really want them to go beyond then maybe you should give them more control you can fix the area like like the typical one now i think everyone is doing it like even my case just now you can see just limit it by sdg something right just they can do anything under that same ndg because under one sdg there's so many scopes at least it's not too confined or even better just ask them to pick any of the sdg that they like right so you give more rooms and then you can you will see a variety of answers and creative not answers i mean creative ideas right creative ideas in solving uh, the problem right then other things you can limit like if you are working as a civil engineering agency or a consultant uh, for civil engineering and that you have some limitation too like for example you can say your total uh, budget is how much you know and then you only have this this amount of people and blah 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 so you can set that kind of normal parameters that they will get in the real world not some parameters that you set like do not exceed uh, like five pages for for blah, blah 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 because you said it because you wanted it easier to mark but in the real world the the proposal could be 10 20 pages for example i mean i mean i'm i'm not saying that you should not there must be some reason why you set that kind of parameters okay that's my point right okay okay any question for part 1 before we move to part 2 just in case just a pit stop for a while part 2 will have some hands on um demonstration or some tools if you can follow you try to follow uh if you can't follow you can watch a recording later i mean the the because you know the the i can understand it's very hard for you to follow step by step when you're on zoom but yeah any question just in case before we go to part two are there <laughs> It's Friday, so yeah, it's uh, we need to Friday. <laughs> need to need to go early. <laughs> the largest kidding. Okay, let's go on to part two: the design and development. This is the part that I think we can work together. I mean, work together as in uh, my own experience says that when we design assessment, try not to design alone. Try to get a bit of ideas from everyone, and especially if you have a team teaching the same course, it's good to look at what other people are doing, and then you get some ideas, or even better, you talk to the industry, uh, share with them. Okay, look, I'm going to ask my student to do this. Do you think it's relevant? You know, or do you think I should tweak uh, uh, in terms of certain requirement? You can, you can always do that. I, I do that a lot for my course, like all these social media uh, agencies or digital media, because I deal with language and communication. Uh, education is my area, but then our university actually do not have an education program yet at the moment. So we only have uh, communication. We have English for global communication. We have linguistics. Uh, we have uh, strategic com communication. So mostly communication style. So we talk a lot with the, all the you know all these media agency here, and then you will you will see what they want, and then when you align this kind of assessment, once the student graduated they instantly functional they will like okay i know what to do already because this is what the industry has you know has um, has uh, kind of uh, told us that they want right so something like that but i know in some areas it will be hard like uh, some generic uh, courses and all be harder because you don't have a specific scope but you can always pitch on or, or or pitch to the relevant programs right even though you're teaching some ge generic pro uh, courses you try to align to the uh, to the program for example you're teaching generic courses but a lot of your students are from engineering then you can try to align to engineering kind of uh, uh, condition or situation even though you're teaching some generic skills like uh, i give you one example i'm teaching uh, one generic one like professional writing so even though i'm teaching one course for multiple faculties i change the content or the the scope according to the program even though they are learning the same skills professional writing 
That's my point, right? So um, in order to design authentic assessment, I think this is, I, I, I have many, I've shared many steps, but essentially I find the one by Open University UK is, is the easiest one to follow, all right? And then they share this openly so you can reuse this. Of course, I think we have, we, you know, we have been bombarded by MQA on all this alignment thingy. So you, you need to make sure that you identify the learning outcome. And then the contact, this is the part that we often skip. We always skip this outcome straight away to task and then straight away to workload. Task as in, we don't even map the contact, we just map LO and the task. We skip the context part sometimes. Like we see the LO is uh, A, then we quickly find a, a task and then just match the A. We forgot about the, you know, the context part. So context can be your industry needs, societal uh, issues, some personal concept, whatever. Means you have to think about the, the context or the situation or the scenario first. Then you decide how you want to do it, right? So the mapping part. Then you have to decide the workload. You're going to go to a bit. And then how are you going to gather the evidence, right? If it's process, if you, if you want to assess process, then in your marking scheme, you need to spell out, like how are you going to mark the process? Like uh, how, like if you ask them, for example, you ask them, oh, I want to see you gather all the evidence of your meeting, your Google Meet, whatever, but they see the marking scheme, no marks. Would you do it? <laughs> like if you're a student, right? If you're a student, uh, you know, you say, you, you, you tell, uh, the lecturer tell you that, no, uh, you need to gather all this evidence. And then in the marking scheme, there's no mark for that. If you are a student, if you, in fact, the intelligent one will not do it, right? Because they know they will not be penalized. So if you want to measure the process, then you need to make sure that it's also in your marking criteria. So of course you can say like, uh, maybe uh, if you want to quantify it, you can, you can say at least three meetings, three evidence on three meetings, maybe depending on how you want to look at it. Or if you don't want to quantify it, it can be slightly more subjective, but you can look at the, the, the how they report, the quality of the reporting, maybe. But quantify, it will be easier to reduce subjectivity, but really depends on the, the scope. What I mean here is, if you want it to be uh, process-based, you want to give marks for the process, then you have to put it in the marking scheme. Or else your marking scheme will be just output. Meaning you don't care what happened in between, you don't really care whether they meet or they do last minute. You just look at the output. Then, is, then your marking scheme will just look at the output, right? But I think in uh, alternative assessment or in authentic assessment, we try to look at it from the pr uh, perspective of process as well, not just output. So uh, try your best to also include maybe a portion of your, uh, uh, the marks for your assessment to, to cover the process part or do it on top. I know some, some, some of my colleagues did this. It's not, in the, it's not in the actual breakdown of the 10%, blah, 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 but it's an extra clause. Like if you don't provide the blah, 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 then they will get a deduction of five marks, for example. So that's an extra, just like the plagiarism, whatever rule that you have, right? So if they exceed certain percentage of similarity, then you will minus. So that could be done as well. If you scared that your, you know, your, your distribution of marks are already quite, uh, quite extensive and you don't want it to be part of your actual rubric, then you can put it as an extra clause, right? Okay, so let's go through a bit uh, on the, uh, you know, learning objective um, or LO. I think you can follow many, many, many styles of doing this. Of course, the typical one will be the smart, the smart, uh, how to put it, the smart goal uh, concept, you know, the specific measurable S, M, A, achievable, and R, uh, relevant, and then time-based, the smart, lah, right? But I, I kind of go away from that, and then I just want to focus on four. Make sure your learning objective, I, you can't change if your course, that is not your course. If you're designing the course, or if you have the chance to do CQI, continuous quality improvement, if you have the chance to do CQI, you can relook at your uh, objective, relook at your uh, course outcome, and look for all these four things. Relevance, complexity, measurable, and authenticity. So for example, relevance, right? Um, it has to be relevant as in, you know, your, the, the, the method that you're choosing is relevant to the LO, right? But sometimes we can't choose that assessment method because the LO is already confining. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because uh, from the start, the LO is problematic. 
I, I'm sure you have that kind of situation where your LO is already fixed and you can't think of other way apart from that. For example, the LO says present, uh, present the, 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 the verbally. They are all stated that way. So you can't change because it has to be done in a present, verbal presentation. You can't think of a different, like uh, suddenly you ask them to write essays or you want them to come up with proposal. You can't because the LO itself says present verbally, right? So sometimes the LO can be too confining that you have no choice but to use certain method. But if your LO is flexible, in slightly more open, then you can decide uh, a different type of me uh, assessment method to align to or to fit to your LO, right? Complexity is also important mainly to be more inclusive because sometimes we think it's easy, but students may not think it's easy, <laughs> all right? Uh, because, uh, but, but if that is the standard, then don't, don't lower the standard. If that is the standard that you think, uh, let's say a year two or a year three students should achieve, even though the current cohort or the current batch could not really, you know, could not really meet that, then don't really lower it because if you lower it, you are not doing justice for the previous cohort. <laughs> like the previous cohort had the same thing and then suddenly this cohort, you, you tone it down. Unless of, you are changing it um, in a different format or may, uh, maybe in a different, um, um, how to put it, in a different presentation mode or whatever, but uh, the standard is still there, right? You don't want it to be like last cohort, you ask them to do that. Like everyone is producing something and then suddenly this message say, oh, I don't need you to produce anything. You just submit a one page essay. So that somehow is a bit, uh, you know, it's a bit off. So the complexity uh, has to be taken into account as well, right? Uh, measurable, right? Ensure that you are able to, uh, uh, to measure, right? If you want them to do A, then you have to think, like, how are you going to measure that? So something that you can see or maybe observable or something that they can prove. Like process just now is, is actually very hard, right? I know students can actually cheat on that. They can fake uh, meet Google Meet even though they don't meet. So they just pretend that they are meeting. So they just ask everyone to screenshot the Google Meet and then to prove that, oh, we have done the meeting. Actually, they don't. But if you want to go a bit deeper, then you can ask them to submit recording and whatever you want. But I don't think you have the, the, the time to actually you know, look at all the, uh, the recording. But maybe uh, you can always uh, ask them to do a little bit more, giving reflection notes or whatever, right? So it has to be measurable. Now, this is the one that I think we are talking about today, uh, the authentic task, something relevant to the real world, right? Not something that we don't really do in the real world. Like answering MCQ, it's not something that in the industry needs, but it's a good way to measure the knowledge part, right? The, uh, uh, to measure how good they are in understanding the concept or the knowledge. But in terms of practical skills or something that they, they, they want them to apply, then you should go away from all this MCQ uh, type of uh, uh, assessment, right? Okay, then the CA, uh, constructive alignment by, by uh, our OBE, all right, our OBE. So everything has to be aligned, right? You have the CRO. This one, I think sometimes some lectures don't do this because we straight away just depend on CRO. But uh, if you have, let's say four CRO, if you have four units, then by right, every unit, you also have the smaller intended learning outcome but normally we don't we just put we just put the lo and then that's it but if you have that would be better because the break the breaking down of the uh, cro to lo will help you to design better activities and better assessment because you can you will know like the easy way out is like this one one uh, lo one thing to measure <laughs> match one to one but sometimes of course one lo can be measured by two types so you just align it uh, uh, e directly but i think the typical will be one 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 lo one one assessment or one one component of it let's say the assessment has three parts so if you have three then it will be lo one lo two lo three that's the direct matching but we know that sometimes it cannot be can be done directly it can be more than one but you align nicely all right so i think the way we see it is that if you align something to more lo if one task has more lo then technically speaking the complexity increases and the workload also increases, right? Because you match more than one LO. So the complexity will be higher because you are doing more than what one LO is required. Then you now you have two, for example, okay? And then something that I think we should be cautious is this, this learning activities and the assessment. Um, this is 
this is the washback thing, lah. You know, the washback effect in assessment where what you teach is what you test, and what you test is what you teach. It can go both ways. The washback effect. Sometimes it's um, um, <laughs> sometimes it's actually causing the problem to the assessment. It's like this. You know assessment is A and then in the class, you keep on giving them activities, exercises about A. So indirectly, when they do A, the assessment A, they will do better. Right? By right, lah, you know, right? they will do better because you have, you, have drill, you have been drilling them about all these things or all these type of activities because you're preparing them for the test. Right? Or it could be the other way around. Uh, you know that you're gonna, they're going to be tested on A, but then you just do some some sample or some uh, some activities together to help them to be prepared, but it's not exactly the same thing. So the assessment can be changed a bit uh, to, to use the same skill set, but not entirely the same. So then you will know whether they understand what you have taught them. If it's identical or quite similar, then you are testing recollection, you know, like uh, they're just recalling whatever you have told them and then everyone will, will be more likely to produce the same thing. Right, they'll probably follow the same style and everything because you showed them before, or you have uh you have designed activities over and over again on the same thing. Okay, so something that we have to be careful on. Uh, don't worry about the arrow. I took this from um at the, the site here, you can see the test mania because they came up with this, but it's always you know whatever works, it can go both ways, all right. Okay, this is a sample, um, but I want you to take a look at this. We're going to do this together. Um, we have some time here. Um, this, is, this is our system. Unima system has this kind of system where we have to key in everything. And then it's, it's, uh, it, it generates a matrix, right? So, oh, sorry. But I want you to look at this. So these are the LO for the course. LO one, two, three. So you have the verb here. And then you have the... Uh, you have the indicators here, the, the correlative, uh, the psychomoto, and also the effective lab, but this one is psychomoto, all right? So take a look at the, the breakdown now. Okay, assessment one, sorry, where's my mouse? Okay, assessment one, CLO one, and then this is the teaching method, this is the activities, and then the allocation mark. Okay, what I want you to do now is quickly go through this like for two, three minutes. Tell me, what are the potential authentic assessment for assessment one? Okay, boleh? Understand? Uh, we, we do one first. Just do one to see how fast you can. Imagine you are now the instructor of the course, right? Instructor of the course, this one. This is your, this is your LO one because it, it matched to LO one, right? Don't worry about the teaching method because uh, but you can you can consider because some teaching method can give you some impression of what they can do. But look at look at the allocated marks, and then quickly quickly share. What type of assessment do you think is suitable for assessment one? By having, uh, you know, by by having all this information now. Okay, can we? So give you some time, two three minutes to think about this. <laughs> Once you once you have your once you have your idea, you just type in the chat. <clears throat> you get my point, right? So imagine that now you are like uh, you are you are going to design an assessment, but you have this, all right? You have this information. O one only. Just try one first. Uh, based on the O one and the uh, the you know the skill indicator there. Um, tell me, <laughs> all right, what type of assessment can be done in, in general, uh, not, not specific, but type. Imagine this is, you're going to replace assessment one, all right? Okay. Once you're ready, you just type, uh, I'm going to give you uh, two, three minutes, so you still have about two minutes.
yeah, psychomotor level four. Psychomotor level four is dynamism, I think. Let me check. Dynamism. Sorry, adapting. Mm, adaptation. Uh, but if you follow the... If you follow the one by MQA, I think they call it something else. <clears throat> Level four. By psychomoto, yeah. By psychomoto, yeah. So it's four, level four. Just to just to just to just to check whether um, authentic assessment can be generated for number one. Demonstrate knowledge on the range of computer-based multimedia materials and the factors affecting a design. We're not going to argue on the O, yeah, because I know if you go and in detail about the O, you can argue a lot about this. <laughs> but then, then we'll assume that you have no way to change the O, right? You have no way to change the O, because if you want to change that, maybe you have to wait another cycle of CQI or critical review. Imagine that you are handle, uh, you are you are, you are asked to handle this course or teach this course, and then it's made open like this, assessment one, and then you have P four here and all that. So can you can you? share a bit like what kind of assessment can you do <clears throat> just to get your level of understanding on this let me just get the psychodome anyone want to start sharing or you need more time <laughs> we try one first um let's see how it goes Yep, just in case, oh, um, we follow the Simpson model. So for MQA, if if you want to check, just go for this document. Yeah? Uh, best practices for, you know, penilaian praja or pentaksiran. But if you go to Psychomoto, they use the Simpson model. There are many models for psycho, uh, Psychomoto. They have Dave, Haro and all that. But the, the, the one by MQA is the Simpson model. So level four is actually mechanism. Right, this one. Okay, it says here basic proficiency, the ability to perform a complex motor skill. This is the intermediate intermediate stage in learning a complex skill. Learn responses have become habitual, meaning they already kind of know what to do. Uh, like for example, use a personal computer, repair, drive a car at that level. At right? that level. They kind of know, meaning level three is guided, right? So level four, they can do it on their own, technically speaking. So they can assemble, build, collab collaborate, demonstrate, manipulate, right? All this. Okay, that's level four. Okay, let's, let's. Okay, I have a few now. Any more? Let's wait for the rest to respond. We have a few now, interesting ideas so far. Just want to see how you match the LO with the uh, with the authentic assessment because right now imagine you are handled handled this course and then it, it only says assessment one it didn't it didn't really say what kind of assessment right so that's the tricky part so now you 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 get the design okay. So we have some ideas now that you can keep sharing, keep typing if you want to. 
Uh, first one, uh, Dota FIFA says, create a multimedia such as podcast or animation or any multimedia with the content showing the current issue or current trend in that particular topic. Okay, the authentic part is quite that, quite true that towards the end. Then we'll talk about the create part in a bit. Create a multimedia presentation, create an advertisement for a specific product, a presentation, portfolio, ask students to create different social media posts with different features and check their likes and comments based on the design. Yeah, that will be really uh, authentic. Any more? Maybe one or two more? Any more? A student to do reports. <laughs> a student to do reports. What else? Now, be, be like, I, like, 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 like I was mentioned just now, it's psychomoto. Um, this, the problem with this, oh, I mean, just talk about the problem first, then we, we deal with it. It says, demonstrate knowledge on the range of computer-based multimedia materials and the factors affecting its design, right? If you look at this whole part, it sounds cognitive, right? Pretty much cognitive based. It doesn't. It doesn't sound that uh, psychomotor-ish. <laughs> but because the verb is demonstrate, means they need to show something, right? Show something, and because it's P four, it has to be more complex. And I think a lot of you, the the suggested here are are quite relevant in a way, the level are quite high because you have to create, right? Create the multimedia, blah, 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 and all that. So the creation part is, is, uh, is quite P4 level because P4 says you are able to use complex skills basically on your own without guided response. If level three in P means you're still there, you're still like uh, giving them the guidance or whatever, but P4, they can fun function uh, and do the complex skills on their own, like driving a car and all that. In this case, I think all of your ideas can be accepted, right? Because you, are, you need to create something. And, um, but of course, I didn't give you the whole context of the content. You are just judging based on this. But the, the thing that you want them to create, the things that you want them to create has to be computer-based multimedia materials, all right? You can see here, uh, they, they, they are co creating content. But what about this? What about this? How do you how do you measure the factors affecting a design? Say, uh, they say then justify why they choose, huh? Okay, yeah, they are right. So the first part of it is okay. They can create all these multimedia. That meaning they have to show the ability to use all these tools. Uh, you know, like if you are teaching them how to use certain tools in social media or whatever, they are able to use those tools and demonstrate how they use it by putting up all this content for you whether it's a multimedia, social media posting, whatever. But the later part of it is this part, the factors affecting, they have to justify uh, why, they, why, they, uh, you know, why they choose that, that kind of design principle, right? Okay, but technically speaking, they have to demonstrate, right? Now, <laughs> what if you, you think that this is too subjective uh, because I um, you still want hard evidences. Right, so uh, like Dr. Allah said, you can ask students to do the report, but not a report. You can combine the idea. In fact, this is this is the one that I showed you just now. So instead of do the justification later, they do a plan telling you, okay, we will create this. We are going to create this multimedia. We are going to consider all these factors. They justify the factors. Then they do it. So the plan part can be a very mini part, like can be two, four page, two to four pages, not too lengthy because the focus is not on that. The focus is on the output in terms of the, uh, the ability to create, right? So you have to proportionate this. So they, they come up with a plan or a proposal, correct? A plan, like a three to four pages, maybe two pages will be enough, a rough plan, but that will allow you to measure this. That plan will allow you to measure this, right? Because when they create the uh, advertisement, you only see the output. You don't know why they do it, right? Unless you, in your assignment, that, that whatever they created, they get the chance to do a reflection. Uh, that would be another way, right? They reflect or they, they, uh, they, you know, they, they kind of have a, like a behind the scene kind of video. I did that before. You have, you have one video they submit and then you ask them to also do behind the scene video. 
So while they are doing the video, for example, they also have to record. Somebody has to have document all this process. So the behind the scene video give you the idea all this reasoning or the factors that they consider when they do it. You get know I me? Mean? Because if you only look at the output alone, you can't you can't measure this, right? You can't measure this. If I if you ask them to do a video and then or multimedia, they, you just see the video, right? You don't you don't know why they they design such a way. So it can be pre in terms of the plan, like a proposal, right? That's a pre, like a pre demonstration thing, and then, or after is the behind the scene thing, right? So behind behind the scene can be during as well. What I mean here is you have a way to know why they consider the 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 whole how to put it the whole uh, design. So it's authentic because that's what the industry has, right? The plan, the proposal. That's what industry needs. Like if you want to bid for a client to manage the social media or the the digital media or multimedia, whatever you want, you have to have a like a mini proposal, right? Or a mini presentation that could be done as well because it's like a motto. It could be a mini pitch before, then they do the content because that is the ultimate P four where they have to do it, right? Creating using all these tools, all this software, whatever. Or it could be after behind the scene. These days, if you notice, a lot of uh, digital media content has that. They will show you the behind the scene. In fact, I like the idea because the behind the scene gives you the whole process of uh, kind of monitoring your student whether they actually do it according to what you want, and also uh, for you to measure the ability to to consider all this. Okay, so I think P and A um, uh, are something that we we can play with when it comes to all this. Uh, skill set and all that, but the one that I think we often confine ourselves to the typical assignment method or the traditional method, it's the C part, right? Like uh, because the cognitive ability, like the creation, like this one, this is also C, but not P anymore. C here means the creation part means they really need to apply more. So this, like for example, C O three now, you can't ask them to have a mini plan so the proposal or the plan has to be slightly longer or more more content uh, more element or more component because of c level here you get I me mean? so apart from doing it they also have to have that kind of critical mind on coming up with a problem statement you know the generating ideas and all that so the for clo3 if you were to do this assessment like this assessment here probably you need to uh, focus more on the thinking part Right, how they come up with the solution, how they come up with the uh, problem statement, and all that. So that portion will have more marks because of the C. I, I hope you get what I mean. Because when you design all this alternative assessment or authentic assessment, you also have to align to their O, right? And most of the time, if you're not uh, in control of the course or you are not the coordinator of the course previously, then you can't ch can't change their O. So you have to make do with the the level. So if you see six, maybe you have more room. Right? But I'm not saying that when you see six, you can't do more hands-on or more practical. What I mean here is because it's cognitive level, then your rubrics will be measuring more on the cognitive part. You can still have the elements of psychomotor and affection, or effect, 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 effective and whatever, right? You can have that or other sub-skills like communication skill, digital skill, whatever you want, but the cognitive part will be the one who will have the larger portion because of that alignment here. Okay, so for example, you have C6. Suddenly, you just ask them to present. I'll give you one example. It's authentic because you ask them to pre present and pitch, but there's no report, there's no plan, or there's no proposals. And then you will be questioned because C, then you, they did they do whatever, but they only pitch. There's no way of knowing what are the critical part of the, the whole process or the whole output. So you have to be careful of that as well because the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the O will affect the way you design the authentic or the alternative assessment just now. It's authentic in a way, but then you have to also align to the, um, to the, the things that we want to measure. This is what I meant earlier where we are formalizing um, alternative or authentic assessment now. Because in true sense of the word, authentic and alternative, it's normally informal, right? Non-graded. But now because we are formalizing it, then we have to align it carefully. It's not just about making it authentic, but then we forgot about the alignment part. So you can see the, uh, you know, which is why I think there is a tendency for us, the moment we see, we see this kind of CC thingy, we love exam. 
right? If you're going to test like t- this one, if I want to make my life easy, I just put, do a final exam, right? I just do a final exam. I can have essay questions. I can have short answer question. And then I just measure this. But the verb here says create, right? So in my case, of course, this is, this is my course. Then I can't do final exam to test them how to create because it doesn't make sense. It, it becomes so unauthentic, right? Or non-authentic. But if, if this one is aligned to the final exam, then maybe because they can analyze principles and all that. That sounds more like a written kind of uh, possibly done in written exam, right? But there is always this tendency. I can, I can guarantee you every time you look at the, your LO, if there's a C component, there is a tendency to, uh, to go for exam. There is a tendency to go for exam because, <laughs> you know, it's easy to, to, to align. Oh yeah, uh, I know I said uh, the idea of record behind the scene activities is interesting, but the concern is maybe, yep, Yep, you have to consider workload. That's why um, you have to look at the overall control of your, of your uh, LO and also your workload, right? And then you also have to look aligned to your expectation. I mean, when I say behind the scene, you are not expecting that kind of, uh, you know, like highly edited and all that. In my case, for example, when I ask them to do behind the scene, I don't, I don't require them to have like editing, whatever, just shoot the, uh, whatever they are doing and then put it in a folder in uh, a Google Drive. That's it. I don't expect them to do all this editing and all that. Just like, let's say today they meet, so they just do a quick uh, round up of the video. Like everyone says something or that, and they just put it out like week one, week two, that's it. All right. So you have to adjust according to the workload. I agree on that. And uh, also consider the technical skills. Don't expect them to do something that is highly technical that will defeat the whole a process or oh, they will spend more time doing on behind the scene instead of the main one okay so behind the scene can be even photos if you want to and all that and uh, 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 don't don't have that kind of uh, expectation that they're going to have to do you know uh, something something really really technical right so that you do you really have to consider on the workload which is in the next few slides i think on the workload part okay uh, any question for this just in case before i move on but I think, like I said, uh, once, once you have problems in designing your own assessment, um, it's always good to talk to your colleagues and also to share. I love to do that a lot because once I design one, like you see the one you see just now, uh, it has, you know, I ask a few of my colleagues to go through. And just in case I overlook something or it could be too tedious or could be too heavy and um, you might want to consider some part. To be to be revised or to be adjusted. All right. Okay. Uh, if no question, let's move on a bit. All right. Clear. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is the next slide. The workload part. Now the workload part is tricky. Tricky. Really tricky. Many reasons. One, they are not taking our course alone. They're taking more than one course. And in my case, for example what I normally do before the semester start, I will take a look at the courses of that cohort or that year that will be taking that semester. I will look through all the courses that they're taking. For example, this semester, when they are taking my course, they are actually taking research methodology. And research methodology has uh, four credit hours. So when I was realigning or rechecking my assessment, I try my best to make sure that the topic that I have uh, kind of suggested or the design of my authentic assessment can also align with other courses so that the student uh, will, will kind of uh, make use of some elements that they have used in other courses. That's my way. Lah. I mean, I'm not asking that you, I'm not asking that uh, asking you to follow me, but sometimes it works, right? Because um, it depends on your course as well. Like my course may be slightly more flexible, so uh, I can do that. So they, they don't feel like, oh, they're going to do something even more heavier. Right. Of course, some, are, some of my colleagues will say, why are you accommodating others? <laughs> why can't others accommodate you? But I think, to be fair, sometimes we have to give and take because at some point, some of the courses that we're teaching can be heavy. Like those who are teaching community engagement and all that, they have to go out, they have to bring like sulam, you are forcing students to go out, do a lot of uh, field work and all that. It takes up more time uh, that they should be spending for other courses too, right? Like maybe one calculus course, they have to sacrifice the calculus class because they have to go and interview this for the Sulam project, for example. So sometimes we overlook this. 
we just think of our course alone, but we don't realize that that semester, they are also taking other courses that could prevent them from performing in your course. But again, I'm not asking you to tone down everything so that you can accommodate others, but it would be nice if everyone can sit together uh, like what we are doing in, in, in our program, we sit together and we take a look at everyone's so that we try to adjust here and there. And even the deadlines too. Uh, in our case, we try our best not to clash, right, for that particular year. Or else, um, you know, everything is on the same day on everything. And then when the output is not good, we are the ones who will be frustrated too, right? We also want the optimum experience for our learners so that they can produce something that we, you know, we feel happy uh, seeing the output too, all right? So that kind of consideration. So you might, this is the first point actually. You might want to consider from student perspective. I mean, when when we do it, we just expect, okay, I have give you three weeks. I assume you can do it in three weeks, but maybe there are so many factors that could prevent them from completing within three weeks, for example. So you might want to consider that. Also breaking out the task. I love to do this. Um, it could help, but it depends on your level, your student. If you think your students are, are quite good, then you don't need this. Let me just show you this now in case you miss it. I love to do this, like this kind of style where you actually do expected deliverables. You tell them what you want, like just spell out what you want so that it's easier for them to check rather than make it a vague thing like you have to do uh, da, 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 and then that's it. You make leave it open. Even though even though you, you, you give them room for creativity, this can be creative too. It's, it, it's open. It's just that you specify the minimum uh, number. But whatever they want to produce here, it's really, it's really free. They, they, can, uh, they can decide on their own. So you still have room for creativity, but slightly more control, right? But not too rigid. Uh, the same sample just now, uh, this one. I also love to break down, right? Um, just clear instruction, do da, 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 da. And then the marking scheme will be da, 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 da. So it follows. So if you, uh, the marking scheme will, will kind of tally the, the output this one this is the marking scheme so the campaign plan will have edg the, the the so you follow exactly your marking scheme matches your matches your outline so it, it helps student to be more uh how to put it more um structured in structured in terms of understanding your 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 expectation but they can still be creative Right? Because all this you don't control. Like this one, I just say your campaign has to run for at least 14 days, but it's up to them. The sequencing and all that, and they have to, they have to justify. All right? So my point is, if you think you're, if you give them one whole chunk or one long, lengthy, uh, one lengthy uh, narrative is too heavy, then you might want to break it down. All right? And that breaking down will be able to help you. Uh, to, to mark, actually. You see here? This what makes it easier for you to, to track progress and you can actually give feedback because you know, okay, week, week three, they are now here. You know, week four, they are now here. You kind of know the progress. So it helps you to help them too. Uh, yeah, last one is clear instruction and resources. Uh, some, Dr. Ala said, do instruction paper for them, right? The good thing about this, if you, if you follow the student from certain semester already, like a few semesters, like now this cohort that I'm teaching, I have followed them for three semesters. They know your style. Because in semester one, like year one, they already get your, you know, your, your, your process of doing it. By the time they meet you again in the following semester, in year two or year three, they know your style. So like my case now, in year three, I have less headache dealing with the expected uh, output or delivery because they know what I want, right? But if you're new, like this is a new course or you only teach it one off, then it will be harder for you to see the progress because you don't get to see the progressive uh, evolution of your learners. You just see one off, right? Habis, the same, that's it, all right? But something for you to think, because as you, as you, if you follow them for a few cohort or a few semester, then you, you can improve this better because you know their level, right? Um, common challenges when it comes to setting assessment. I think we know this, uh, the first one, this one. Uh, Fanny, I will ask you to, to kind of share now. How do you do this? How do you avoid bias? Like, um, <laughs> I think one reason why traditional assessment is so popular, like MCQ and all these are so popular, is because it's, it's kind of objective, right? Like MCQ, if you got it right, you got it right. If you got it wrong, you got it wrong. 
when it comes to authentic assessment, it becomes very subjective in certain parts and it makes it harder to assess. So, um, yeah. So I want to hear from you very quickly now on this. How do you, how do you deal with this? <laughs> because I myself have a problem with this sometimes. But how do you do this? Avoiding bias. Um, even though you have rubrics, even though you have marking scheme, the tendency for us to be biased is there. Uh, uh, especially when we see something that we like. It could be a topic. It could be the layout. It could be the color preference. It could be the person behind it, right? And all these factors. How do you ensure that you are really fair in assessing your, your students? Any idea? Or maybe, you know, any, <laughs> any, things, any, any methods or any strategies that you have used so far? Or you try your best to be really, really subjective. Uh, sorry, really, really objective in marking all these uh, <laughs> projects and all that. Let's say portfolio, you know, portfolio. You have your requirement. They need to produce this, 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 this. But there are some areas like, for example, creativity that says uh, they have to be creative and you give 10 marks for creativity. How do you ensure that you are assessing them accurately or fairly for that creativity part? Looking at the criteria you created uh, previously, right? Uh, what else? If it's if it's criterion based, right? If it's criterion based, let's say sub creativity part that element that marking scheme says, uh, creativity means you have the you have to have that. And how do you hold true to that? <laughs> Some say come up with a standard rubric to follow. Yeah, yeah. Imagine we already have the rubrics, right? You have creativity and all that. Usually, I will go through all assignments submitted. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was, I was thinking along that line. More than one examiner. Mm -hmm. What was mentioned by uh, Noah Zinun there, uh, go through all assessment first and then try to, try to rank according to criteria. That will be workable, right? Even though it's actually not, not really objective objective because if, if it's objective then you shouldn't compare you should look at it one by one i mean if you talk about criterion based assessment it's one by one right it's you shouldn't compare <laughs> but then i always argue this point as well if i don't compare how do i know what is nine what is seven what is four out of ten right i mean even though we have the rubrics clearly says that, oh, you have, but what if everyone has the minimum, right? Everyone has the minimum as, as specified in the rubric and suddenly now you're going to give marks according to uh, one to 10, right? You know that if you give all nine, it wouldn't be fair because some are very badly designed, some are nicely designed, or you think you should, have, you should just give them all nine because they meet the minimum. Anyone can argue on this? <laughs> I'm just poking your brain. I know, I know, I know what is the <laughs> ultimate answer, but do you think it's fair to do that? Let's say, okay, I'm showing, I'm showing my rubrics. This, let's say, where's my the creativity part? Is, do I have that? Mm, yeah, here. Imagine this is a very simplistic one. Okay, this one. Okay, I have 20 marks allocated one to four, five to eight, nine to ten. Okay, let's say let's say you have 10 submitted and all that and then everyone has this minimum right they have all this but some may lack a bit of creativity but somehow they are more or less there how do you decide is it 9 or 10 or 11 or 12 <laughs> uh, <laughs> any idea I question myself I, I'm questioning myself because this is my rubrics but I would, let, I would love to hear from you. Let's say everyone, after you have seen, let's say 10 submitted, uh, you know, 10 submitted design, for example, and then everyone falls into this category because this one can have some problem there. That one can also have some problem there. But technically speaking, they fall into the same descriptors, right? But because you put 9 to 12, how do you know that one is 9 or that one is 10 or that one is 12? Difficult, right? <laughs> it becomes very, very subjective. So I, my, my point is like this. Even though we have a criterion-based marking scheme like this, 
it looks very criterion based because our skill is not definite one to five. If it's one to five, will be clear cut. In fact, you are encouraged to do that. The problem with one to five or one to ten kind of thing is that you have to think of different different skill. And then sometimes some part need more mark. It cannot be five marks, right? It cannot be five marks. You need more marks. So you have cases like this, right? So it will be, you will be, yeah, yeah. It can be lengthy, but I think it make the range smaller because the longer it is, then the range smaller. But the easy way out is always to reduce the scale because the, the reduction of the scale, that like one to five is clear cut. If you have that, then everyone will get a three. You don't even have to argue whether it's nine, 11, 10. Three, three. Right, which is why the standard kind of rubric style is always one to five, one to five, or maybe one to seven. Right, one to seven. Very rare you you see one to ten kind of descriptors. What happens is you will have like five. You just multiply right by five. Oh, sorry, uh, five lah. You know, like five, ten, um, um, uh, uh, fifteen, twenty, because it's easy, right? Because you want to allocate more marks for that. Okay, so how? So that's the part that I think subjectivity will come in. But at least, even if, even though it's subjectively uh, done, you know, even if it's subjectively done, you are still confined with this area. So to me, like what was mentioned by uh, the as you know just now. So within those range, whether you like it or not, you still have to do a bit of comparison across the ten. For example, if you have ten falls into the same nine to twelve, obviously one will get slightly lower, 9. The other one will get 12 or some will get 12 or 11 because you're going to range it out. So uh, uh, you are ranging it according to a confined scale already. So it's safer. Still okay because students will know they fall into the same category or same descriptors, but they're going to get lower marks because they, they might miss some other uh, elements. Or the best is you tell them. <laughs> I don't know whether you have time, but if you ask, if you have small smaller group, you should do that. Like you can say, this is a nine, this is a ten, this is an eleven, this is a twelve, and then they will see, and they would see why. Then you don't have to, you don't have to be questioned because they will know why that one is a nine, that one is a twelve, because you're being transparent. Transparency is one way to re reduce a problem with uh, unfairness, because once is once is transparent, it's clearer. And students will know why they get that kind of marks. But if you have definite criteria like this one, about three to five, less than three, less than three, this one will be easier to mark because you quantify it, right? So if that group has less than three, you have to decide whether it's one to four or five to eight, but then you look at other things, maybe 14 days, this one less than 14 days. If that one has 14 days, then they, the maximum they can get is eight. The maximum they can get. Uh, they get, can get is eight, the minimum is five. Then from five to eight, you have to decide are you going to give six or seven due to what reason? Maybe you can quantify even uh, uh, the numbers. Maybe out of 14 days, only one mistake. So I'm going to give you eight. Out of 14, I think you this group did more than that. Maybe three mistakes. I'm going to give you six, something like that. All right. But at least you are confined to that uh, narrower band or narrower scale. We are not trying to be technical in terms of the you know uh, validity, reality kind of measure. If by right we should do that, but I don't think for for authentic assessment like this we should go to into that detail because after all you will know that they still fall on the same band. I call that the, the global band kind of thing. It's like arguing is three point nine worse than four, right? It's a if a student get three point eight, is she worse than three point nine? You get what I mean? Because the, the, the difference is too small to even differentiate, right? Something like that. But if that student deserves to get a 12, but then you put it a lower band, suddenly you give the student or that group eight, then you have to relook, right? Uh, one way, one mentioned there by Dr. Karima is more than one examiner or one assessor. If you have multiple colleagues teaching the same course, that will be a nice way to, uh, to check. To cross check or to you know to moderate your marks, but I don't think uh, you have the time if it's um, if it's uh, you know you you control the cost alone. So that moderation part will be, will be really useful. In fact, you are encouraged to do that anyway for all assessment, not just for final assessment. For all assessment, if you have the chance, you might want to have a peer review, 
like like my kids just now, I would I was telling you. So like rubrics and all this, I will just show to my my colleague. Just go through a bit if I miss out anything or maybe I need to change the wording and whatnot. Okay, okay. So uh, something for you to think about. Uh, yeah, you have to balance the rigor and accessibility as well. This one is challenging because sometimes, like what was mentioned just now, if you want to ask them to do behind the scene, then you don't expect them to have that highly technical, you know, video camera, whatever, because you know that is not accessible. So you make it easier. Like, okay, all you have to do is just do a selfie video, or whatever, that's it. After all, everyone is comfortable doing selfie video or Wi-Fi, just put it up on the Google Drive or Padlet, Padlet, create a Padlet for them, make it accessible for everyone. All right, uh, time constraint as well is also a factor, not for you alone, but also for students. Uh, the, the task or the, um, the assessment may take too long, cannot be completed within the time frame. then you might want to reconsider the, the workload or the, the task, all right? Okay. Um, okay, um, strategies. This I'm suggested, I think this is just some, something for you to consider. Um, one way to ensure fairness as well, apart from, apart from looking at the individual assessment, would be multiple, a multi-model or multi-assessment methods, right? Okay, so you can do quizzes a bit, you can have authentic assessment a bit, so you have a mix. Not like everyone is assessed using the same uh, uh, method or same assessment alone. So you have a diversity of mixing between traditional and authentic or alternative assessment. This is, this is quite useful. I think now these days, we have a lot of uh, tendency to go for quizzes. So quizzes is like a balancing act here to also accommodate those who, who may not like uh, may not like all these authentic assessments. Also group and individual, right? These days, students don't really like group work, but um, you have to balance. There are some, some portion where it's individual, some portion which is, uh, which is group because you want to balance this, right? Cultural sensitivity, your task should be really look into this, not too biased to only certain culture or a certain group of background. So that would not be nice for your assessment or it could be unfair because you're giving advantage to that group. You know what I mean? So you need to think of something where everyone has a level playing field, like everyone is equal in, in starting. Not like when you design the task, those who have more uh, better ability will go up, right? Like just like the creating multimedia just now, right? The creating just multimedia just now. If you design in such a way, or your marking scheme is uh, prioritizing the editing skill and all that, those who have experienced editing video will have an advantage, right? But if you're not looking at that, you are looking at how they apply the principles that you have taught them in designing all these materials and all this uh, uh, multimedia content then you are probably giving a better level playing field because everyone has to learn from you first. Not like, oh, I don't have to learn from you because uh, you are going to measure my uh, technical editing. So I have this experience using Adobe Premiere and all that. So I'm going to be advantaged. You get what I mean? So because of that. Certain software preferences too. Like even statistics sometimes, we, we, we only limit to SPSS and all that. There are so many um, statistical software. Why don't we allow them to explore other software like John Mavi is a, a very good open source statistical software. Why do we have to confine to SPSS, for example? Uh, so these are the consideration that we need to think about when it comes to uh, accessibility. Because not everyone has equal opportunity to, to pick up that uh, uh, skill or the, the knowledge behind all these tools, right? Okay, a quick one. Uh, I don't want to go through this because you, I think you have you have done a lot on this, <laughs> on your chat GBT, on all these tools to generate a marking scheme to rubrics and all that. And I'm sure you have session on that too. I want to focus on this one. Can we? All right, this one is similar, but this is more to school, but you can explore on your own, but I want to focus on this one. Teachology.ai. So if you're on your computer, if you're a laptop, then maybe you can open up technology AI. If you're using mobile phone, tablets, then you can do it later after this uh, by watching the recording. So I'm going to go to technology. This tool will be really helpful in helping you to design some authentic assessment um, in, how to put it, in designing, um, you know, in designing or getting some ideas on what to, what to put in your authentic assessment. You can rely on, you can rely on ChatGPT, Copilot, or whatever you want, no problem, because uh, those are capable. The only problem with ChatGPT, notice, because it's open-ended, 
you really need to memorize or remember the prompts. If you give very simplistic prompts, then it will not be helpful. But I'm going to go here first, right? I'm going to go here first. Very simple one. Just go to teachcology.ai. This is a very nice handy tool. And the good thing about this, they are having a team of instructional and designers and also educators behind it. They are not designing by software engineers alone. So they have good uh, instructional background on, on how things work in assessment, in teaching and learning. So you can see the output is slightly better than all these open-ended kind of tools. So you go to Teachcology AI, sign in. You can sign in using Google or Microsoft. I'm gonna go for Microsoft, uh, Google. Okay. Uh, you can follow now if you want to, or else you can do it later. After all, uh, <laughs> it'll be very hard for you to follow directly because we are not meeting face-to-face. -face. Now, once you sign in or log in, you will see this thing first. Your robot is ready and standing by. Tell me more. And then working with AI. Da, 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 da. Okay, it's like this. The concept is like this. Tishcology or tish, some, some say Tishcology or AI. It's like your assistant. And they call it robot here. They call it robot here. Once you sign up, you get to use this about, I think, 13 times. 13, 13. One, three. One, like a, not one go, but like a, a reset of every day. So if one day today you use it more than 13 times, 13 time, then, uh, then uh, you, you will not be able to continue using the robot. You can still use other things, but not the robot, right? So you have to wait 24 hours. Every time you use something that requires the robot to interfere or intervene, then it will take up one component of it. If you see here, tell me more, it will say, uh, once you exceed the limit, the robot will need to rest. Robot pun kena rehat. <laughs> the robot also need to rest. Or you can upgrade to a stronger robot to gain going. I think you don't have to upgrade. My experience is sufficient to use a free one. What? But what is this? This is a very nice handy tool to not only plan your lesson, but also to help some idea with your assessment. I think the problem with us is we have a lot of interesting ideas, but um, we don't know how to structure it in a proper a proper, you know, recognizable, authentic assessment format, or maybe the style, because you're so used to the traditional way of giving out a size assignment and all that. So this tool will help you. So once you sign in, right, you can go by one by, you know, by plan and all that. I, I can show you by plan first. Let's go for this one. Click to plan a lesson. Right, click to plan a lesson. You can type in your details. Let's say I'm teaching uh, copywriting. You have to be more specific if you want to. Then you have an option, whether you want to generate the outcome or you provide the outcome. Generate means you don't give them the LO. This system will generate the LO for you. In your case, because we have the course outline already, then you input your LO. Clear? All right? You input your LO. So you can type your LO here. You copy paste your LO. Let's say uh, apply principle. Uh, let's say IDA principles in creating copywriting blah 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 okay for example then you can put the code here now one thing good is it's aligned to bloom taxonomy only at the moment uh, but you can always change this to to your psychomoto or effective later but it follows the bloom taxonomy okay let's say your bloom taxonomy for this one is apply then apply then you can put your code because we have codes for this so c apply c4 right C3, sorry, C3, sorry, C3. If you have other codes, then you can put in your code, whatever. Then just add, keep on adding. I'm going to do another one. Uh, demonstrate understanding in the use of social media. Okay, I'm going to do two just to show you. So this is maybe demonstrate, could be, um, yeah, maybe analyze. So <laughs> just, just a sample. Okay, you can see everything is aligned here. If you key in your LO here nicely, according to your course outline, um, you will be able to create better, uh, better assessment, right? If you do go for gen generate outcomes, then the AI will do it for you and may not align to what you want, right? It's better for you to put in your own outcome here, right? Then you choose whether you want to go for inquiry-based learning you want to go for direct instruction or you want to go for project-based learning. At the moment, 
the team has created only three approaches. But to me, it's already sufficient because these are the ones that we normally use. Inquiry-based learning covers everything like problem-based learning, challenge-based learning, all those that requires inquiry learning then goes under that. If you have POBL, problem-based, project-based learning, then for problem-based, problem-oriented PBL, all right? So that will be under project-based learning. If you're teaching direct means you just want to test directly the knowledge part, then you go for direct. But we're not going to rely on direct instruction because we're talking about alternative and also authentic assessment. So let's go for inquiry-based learning or maybe project-based learning, up to you, right, for now. Then you can choose your, your, the language that you want. Then you will generate draft. Now, before you click generate lesson draft, you can also upload your content here. See here, enhance the AI with my content and content I have access to. Let's say you want this assessment to be aligned to your lectures or your content, your teaching materials. So you can upload your teaching material here first. So when this robot or AI is generating the idea for the assessment, it will take into consideration your materials, right? Then you turn it on. If you have, now in my case, I have not uploaded anything, then I will just turn it off. If you have, then you just click this one and then upload here, all right? I don't have any because I have not uploaded my, my, uh, uh, my content. So if I click this one, right, I don't have any. Right. So how do you upload? Later on, you will see how you upload. Uh, let me let me leave it blank first. Right. Uh, so oh yeah, it refreshes everything. <laughs> That's the problem when I click refresh. Okay, never mind. Just do a quick one. I'm gonna ask it to generate. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna ask it to generate. Right. It will, it will generate. Uh, and then you pick you pick the approach. Then click generate lesson draft. So it will do the magic for you. <laughs> it will do all this uh, ideation and then you can check uh, as uh, it's generated and because you have your own LO your outcome then you can align nicely you don't have to do the manual alignment all right just a quick one so I'm going to demonstrate this um, this the later on you can try it on your own it won't take long. Like you see, it's about two minutes um, the beauty of it is you have more ideas on what type of activities that you can do for your assessment. So it's generating now. I can show you what I have as well. If I go to my dashboard, uh, my plan lesson right here, then I, you can see some other topic. That are, now I have it now. You can see lesson title, copywriting. I'm going to zoom in a bit. Then it will give you the description. If you have your own description, everything, please put, yeah, don't rely on AI. Then you can see the outcome here. This one is, I ask AI to gen for me. In your case, you shouldn't do this. You should put in your own LO. Whatever LO that you don't want, you just click this button, edit outcome, and then just delete. Let's say I don't need this, delete, delete, all right, delete, all right? Or you want to change, you can edit whatever you want, all right? Once done, um, just view outcome. Then you will keep the one that you want, okay? Then based on this outcome, one, two, three here, you will see the idea. Like one first activity is copywriting brainstorming. So this is the activity. If you go next, headline exploration. If you go next, copywriting different medium. So these are ideas that you can do for your assessment or activities, right? This is the lesson content that you can do. Same thing with the other ideas. So you can also do copywriting critique. You, you, will, you will be able to align. So this one is... Uh, copywriting in different medium and you can see at the bottom here it aligns immediately to the LO you can even match it with supporting skill like collaboration curiosity or all this critical thinking communication skill that we have of course some some we don't have in Malaysia our MQA don't have like curiosity and all that so you can select other relevant ones right like communication or digital skills and all that. So if you want to align to that, okay, save changes and all that. So these are all activities that you can use. I'm not saying that you have to use everything. This is like an idea generation tool and it helps you to align directly with your uh, LO. All right. Then this is the part where you will go to uh, the quiz builder if you have quiz. If you want to do quiz, for those who love quiz to do like progressive checking, you, based on whatever you have key in just now, those are the assessment ideas and all that you can also generate a quiz based on the LO. Just pick the LO, 
then just generate questions that you will generate. I'm, I know you can do this in ChatGPT and all that. Fine, like I said, right? Those are manual, do your own uh, prompting and all that. This one is slightly more organized, slightly more structured. Okay, so it will build and then you can uh, go for the, uh, how to put it? Go for the uh, question, go to the questions and then check, right? So this is an essay, uh, sorry, essay easy, right? So blah, blah, blah. So from all these kind of ideas, sometimes you can also generate, you can also generate more ideas on what to test or what to assess your students. So I'm, I'm proposing you to kind of use this to get more ideas. I'm not asking you to use everything blindly, of course, but because this idea generation tool is quite useful in helping you to think of better ideas uh, for your assessment, whether it's authentic or whether it's traditional. Okay. All right. So you can also click build assessment here again. Then you can click build assessment. Then you can decide what you want to assess, outcome and everything, and go for the um, no, the approach. Okay. So like, like, like I show you just now, in a short time, in, in a short time like this, I can have plenty of ideas of what to assess based on the oh, like all this. One, two, I mean one category, two categories, but within one category, you can have one, two, three kind of ideas. So it's quite nice when you are uh, trying to figure out what other things that you can do for your assessment. Okay. The beauty is always the alignment. I like this because it aligns directly with the uh, LO, right? And LO, you don't have to rely on the robot. You can key in your own LO, like this one. Again, edit outcome. You can key in your own LO, right? Okay, that is Teachcology AI. If you have the time later on, please try it out. You can see here, your robot can perform 12 more actions this shift. The, 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 the robot is a bit, you know, like human, need to... Need to, need to rest after 13 action, right? And then you have to wait 24 hours. At least they're not charging you to use directly. They only let you use the free one uh, 13 times per day. So if you're done for today, you can continue tomorrow and then you will reset. It's not like uh, you have to upgrade all the time, okay? Right now, this team is still uh, improving this. So from time to time, if you notice any bugs or whatever, feel free to contact the team and then they can add because then now they're adding this. If you go to pedagogy, they're adding more things here later on. So you can, you can do more, more than just uh, inquiry-based learning and all that. So you can be more specific, like challenge-based, problem-based and all that. They're, they're, they're trying to do that uh, at the moment. Okay, it's still free. So just make use of it while it's still free. Eduate is similar, but it's for schools. Later on, if you have the time, you can go to Eduate and then uh, explore. You will see similarities. Um, Eduate also comes with a specific component for gamification. So if you are into gamification, then uh, you can tick that gamification part and then you will generate the gamified activities for you. Right? So explore this too. This, the top one, I leave it to you because I'm sure you are, you know, you are familiar with all the chat GPT and all that already. So, but these two are highly recommended. All right, any question before we move on? No, eh? <laughs> so this is for prompting style. I think you know this already, but if you're using ChatGPT or whatever, if you want ChatGPT to produce better outcome, then you can follow this kind of strategy. Give RTF, the role, the task, the format. So you are an expert in assessment, explain what is formative assessment, write in two paragraphs, blah, blah, blah. This is if you are talking about this, if you are designing assessment for your for your uh for the industry, you can change this. You are you are a consultant for uh, a multinational company, right? Um, a designed a task for interns for novice uh, workers on how to how to do a proper plan or something, right? Write the the, the, the write the instruction for the university student. This is output means what do you expect them to produce? What do you expect the uh ChatGPT to produce for you, right? Whether it's in a step-by-step step, like this, write it in step-by-step step manner or just a paragraph. So be more specific in the task, what is needed, and then the desired outcome. If you follow this kind of format in prompting, you will get more meaningful output from ChatGPT, Gemini, and all this. If you make it open, like design an assessment for this, it will be so open, all right? Okay, this is just an additional one. This is a sample that I did. This is for my course uh, last semester. Um, uh, 
This is language, culture, and communication, and I I I use it. I use a lot of case studies, so uh, I I do a bit of gamification. But I, what I did is because I ran out of ideas, so I use AI to generate something like this. All I did was I specify the format I want. So I will say, I will ask AI to produce a case file having name, profile, occupation, goal, and situation by focusing on different contexts. So this is. This is an undergraduate at university. This one, a young American, African American in late twenties. So, but the bottom thing, the bottom line is, I want them to learn co-cultural approach. So I have, I can have different cases in a short time, without having to hunt for so many, uh, you know, articles. So I I can practice with them. Then I can turn this into uh, a real case if I have. Like this one, I have a real case for them to think. But instead of asking them to to come up with the output, I ask them to to generate two questions from ChatGPT and then ask them to to respond. Obviously, this is assess. Uh, this is not assessment. This is activity. But this one is assessment. This is a progressive assessment. A mini mini reflection report. Ten uh, percent. This is activity. But what I mean here is you can do sim something similar, where you have real case, authentic case, but then ask them to ask ChatGPT to evaluate the response and then compare. If you want to use AI in the process. Instead of banning it, you want them to learn how to decide whether the the output generated by AI can be trusted or uh, you know might need human intervention. In fact, they need human intervention anyway. Uh, my experience, the, I I I documented the whole thing in a portfolio. This one, whole, my whole portfolio for this course is uh, I documented nicely. So my experience, I did a study on this. Um, what happened was after a few tasks on this, students become reluctant to use ChatGPT because they realize the output are really nonsense, <laughs> because not helpful, not helpful at all for them to be contextualized to certain cases. So in a way, you are encouraging them to use, but also learn how to decide what is good, what is not, right? Because this course is not prioritizing the uh, prioritizing the output alone. They they need to show the thinking part. But if you are teaching language. If you only measure the essays, whatever, then it will be harder because they should just give you the essay generated by AI, but you don't know whether you know, it's really authentic or not, right? Uh, yeah, just to show you that we have this already, just in case you're not aware, uh, you can download the um, manual or guidelines on the use of generative AI in higher education produced by MAPTA and also Magnetic. Uh, do download because you can see some some of the what do and don't things that you can do things and you cannot do and, and, and all that okay part three actually very short because we only have 10 minutes in fact nothing much here uh, part three is on the feedback part uh, in any assessment I think we need to prepare feedback but my my uh, proposal to you is instead of doing feedback do feed forward because we don't have time for feedback what do I mean by feed forward <laughs> Feed forward is giving feedback in to, to, to push students to, to improve. That this is the feedback first in general, because you want them to be uh, you know, to, to, to have some sort of self-reflection and then promote continuous learning. Of course, the timelessness as well. It has to be applicable in different contexts or different time and has to be constructive. The problem is we don't have time to give feedback to every assessment. Most of the time, by the time you finish all assessment, it's already the end of the semester. The student will not have the chance to improve. By right, um, if you ask them to do assessment one, right after what within one or two weeks, they need to get back and then know what, what happened, right? Apart from seeing the scores alone, they need to know what happened. Like, uh, how did you assess me or what, what, what did I did wrong and all that. But most of the time, we don't have that chance because of the you know, the time constraint and the number of students, the size, the class size, everything. So you might want to consider using feed forward, all right? Feed forward as in every time you have the chance to give feedback, um, try to be more positive, like directing them towards the uh, the direction already, all right? So so like, like, like this is an example summarized by this book. You can go for what if we added this, you can give a bit more and then you can have like describe the problem and the impact and prompt the person here, the student, you know, the student for a solution. So 
I know this is a bit tricky because we are so used to giving feedback, and every time if we do this, somebody will question you, like, why are you so nice to the student? Um, we shouldn't help students too much because they need to be independent and all that. But the the thing is, this is fit forward. It's not for you to do every day. What I mean here, if you have the chance to 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 give feedback to your learners, instead of always be reflective, because back means being reflective of what they have done, you are like foreseeing what is going to happen, and then you tell them. I think what you did is okay, but to improve, just go further on this. So you, they have not done that yet, but you are foreseeing that if they do it there, then it will be better. So you are feeding forward. Because if feedback means they have to do it first, then you respond, right? But you don't have time to respond anyway. So might as well, well by the time you have the chance to meet them or to, to, uh, to give feedback to them, you feed forward, <laughs> all right? I mean, this is just something for you to, to consider. Uh, there are many um, reading on this. You can just type feed forward. There are many examples. But the, uh, the key component of it will be goal-oriented. You have to tell them what is the, you know, the end goal and everyone will be like um, aware of, that let's say if you want students to do campaign plan when they come and tell uh, show you instead of saying this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong you can say well i see what you're doing but you're not heading towards the direction that we want the goal is the the the, the but somehow you are off track a bit you're not heading to that goal can you like uh, do you know realign and then or restructure this part so that we can head to the same goal we we have to emphasize on the goal rather than what they did wrong so that they know, like four page or campaign plan, then they know oh, they have to do that only, all right? Or that is the goal that they, they need to achieve. It has to be actionable. You need to tell them what to do. I know, again, this is something really tricky. Some lecturers will tell me, like, oh, you're spoon feeding. To me, it's not spoon feeding. This is scaffolding. It has to be actionable in a way like uh, tell them what to do. You're not, you're not telling them like uh, specifically, more like uh, directing them, why don't you explore this? Why don't you look at this and all that? If they don't want to do it, you can't, you can't help them anyway. What I mean here is instead of giving a vague idea, like go and Google your own, uh, I don't know, you might want to ask others and all that, then it's not helpful because you are not feeding forward. You are, later on, you will be dealing with the feedback part because they will like keep on asking you and then you are very angry because they keep asking you. Obviously, when a student keep asking you something, easy it means they don't understand at all right whether they have asked the friends or whether they have asked others they, meaning they don't really get it so if if that happens you might want to reconsider why you know they are they are facing that kind of problem and then try to make it ex actionable and then do a bit of positive reinforcement not all the time sometimes because all the time then it will be tricky for you to build the you know the momentum there because you don't want it to be too uh too lenient as well right some other things for you to consider. I think this is the, the thing that we should aim for in our teaching and learning. You need to create a safe space uh, where people here, the learners, of course, um, you want them to learn, right? Because that's where people don't hesitate to try and don't worry about failing. The reason why we have a lot of students who still submit things in according to, uh, you know, the old way of doing things or um, the, the thing that they think is right because they fear this. You know, they don't want to fail. Like they, they feel like if they don't do it that way, they're going to fail the course, even though they, you want them to be more open or more flexible it's because they're so used to this already. So I think this is something that we sh all of us should strive for to build the trust, you know, to have that transparency, lead by example, non judgmental environment, and also to be having that active listening. This is also good. I think it, it's a good practice after every assessment, if you don't have time to give feedback to every single student, it's always good to show the sample. After all, MQA requires us to put in our portfolio the good, the bad, and the average. So instead of just pleasing MQA, why don't we let the student know? After every assessment, do you, you can blank out the, uh, the metric number or the name. Just, okay, this is a good sample. This is an average sample. This is a not so good one. So for them to see why, they are getting that score. Oh, okay, I'm closer to this one. That's why I'm getting this. Well, I'm, 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 you know, I'm lacking all this same like this sample. That's why I'm getting that mark. Then you reduce your burden of having to give feedback to everyone because you have the sample ready for them to see if they want to see. If they don't want to see, it's, <laughs> it's not your problem anymore. All right? Okay. Um, yeah, these are, hey, sorry, this is a duplicate. So just ignore this slide. Some key takeaways. We are ending already. Some key takeaways, uh, I think we, hopefully this session has enlightened all of you about what is 
authentic and what is alternative. Sometimes what, is, what seems to be authentic may not be authentic. What seems to be traditional may not be traditional. Um, and then think about the design part and then the fit forward strategies. I think that's all from me. Um, I want to leave it, leave the session with the quote by Sir Ken Robinson. You know, uh, he said this, uh, learning happens in the minds and so not in the databases of multiple choice tests. So really need to rethink of the way we do authentic and alternative uh, assessment. I think that's all from me. If you have any questions still, I can still entertain some, I think, before, <laughs> just in case. Pass back to the Dorini. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Shua. Okay, uh, I think we can have one a question, I think. Uh, anyone would like to ask the question? We have okay. like four minutes left, uh, less than four minutes. Yeah, it's already 12, so <laughs> no question. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, so I don't think we have any questions. Uh, that's okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Hi. This is very interesting. Thank you so much for your sharing. Really appreciate it. Um, um may I know I tried the technology AI, right? Dish or dish holology AI. Uh -huh. So uh, I was wondering, can we uh download the the content there or we need to copy paste? Because oh, yeah, it allows you to download in Excel format, I think, just now. Wait, let me see. If you go to download, wait. If you go to download, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't share my screen. Let me share my screen. If you go to download, for every lesson that you have, let's say I click this lesson. If you go to export and download, you have export to Word, sorry, not Excel, Word. So everything is in Word format. So you don't have to copy and paste. So you see, nicely done for you. So you don't have to, you don't have to copy paste. If if you are doing assessment like quiz builder, it even gives you the the uh, the answer key and all that. All right. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. I tried the yeah. gamification. It's very interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. If if your LMS, if your LMS has uh sub, has this JSON plugin, maybe you can ask. I don't know whether who is in charge. If they support JSON, you can export a JSON and then it can up, uh, you can upload the whole thing into. Uh, your learning management system using this uh, like a lesson format. So everything is already there. You don't have to copy paste to your uh, to your LMS. All right. If you plan it nicely here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, there's one question from Prof. Jamal. How yeah. to evaluate the evaluation? Evaluation? My, my evaluation or what evaluation is it? Evalu <laughs> evaluation means? Uh, Jamal? <laughs> Basically, how to evaluate your assessment. Ah, your assessment. How to evaluate? What do you mean? Um, by marking scheme or... Um... No, how, how good our, our assessment is. We ah, have assessment, okay. Right, for the study plan. Yeah, more on... more. I think the... the, the how to put it? The, the greater level of evaluation, of course, will come from the learner and also the CLO achievement. And the um, in our case, we look at CLO achievement because our assessment is aligned to LO. And then in our system, we will have this scoring of how many, like the, if the student get 10% from that assignment, it's actually contributing to how many percent of the LO. So if you're asking me uh, for the, how do we know that the, the assessment is good or not. One is to look at CLO achievement. The other one is, of course, to also have a proper, um, um, how to put it, assessment, a comparative and analysis of all this assessment, which I don't think we do at the moment because we don't have time. Um, but the best indicator to me is always the student evaluation. <laughs> student, I mean, student not evaluating you, evaluating the one by one because we have that. We, the student will give the feedback on the, about the assessment uh, in general, whether it is the workload is too difficult or the time taken or all that, apart from all this scoring that they get. So the achievement part is on the CLO achievement, but the general evaluation of the assessment itself comes from the student. Yeah. I hope I answered that. Thank yeah, thank you, Mr. Chua. I think I got the idea. OBE yeah. is closing the loop as well as the feedback. Thank you so much. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. I think for OBE, we just have to go for zero achievement, whether we like it or not. But I, I do find it more meaningful to also listen to student testimonial, you know, and all this uh, feedback that they give about the assessment. They will tell you this is too difficult. They will tell you 
we are not ready for this and at least you get an idea whether the assessment is okay or not okay <laughs> yeah yeah we will have that thank you yeah 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 okay okay thank you for the for the question i think i think let's just wrap up uh, yep. thank you everyone for your participation in this training we hope to see you again uh next time inshallah thank you very much to mr chua uh, thank you so much to everyone as well in the field uh inshallah we'll be having you uh in future <laughs> okay thank you thank you Dr. Rainey. thank you everyone let's end with us kafara so to us okay so before we dismiss let's turn on our camera for those who have not done so yet let's take a picture okay, we have i have here about four screens so so this is screen number one Modern day record. <laughs> yes. Day evidence. <laughs> evidence that CPD has conducted the training. <laughs> it's amazing what pandemic has done to us, right? I mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So let's smile. One, two, three. So, so this is for the screen number one. One, two, three. Okay. Let's go to screen number Okay, one more. Okay. So I'm in screen number two. Yeah. Let's move, Sanyu. Okay. All right, uh, sorry, okay, it's screen number three, and last one. Okay, got every screen. Thank you so much, Adoni. Thank you so much, Mr. Shua, for, no for uh, our invitation. <laughs> All right, I see you. When I see you, thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. <clears throat>